Welcome to this week's edition of the Swider Insider. I'm your host, Rusty Lindsay. Joined as we are prior to each football game with head football coach Mike Swider. And coach, we get a special quarterfinal edition of the Insider, one that we haven't got a chance to do before. You guys come off a, uh, a convincing win over Central where I think Tim March said it best on the broadcast. You just kind of avalanched them in the first quarter and, and made it pretty easy on yourselves for the last 45 minutes of that game. Yeah, it, it you know, reminded me a little bit of the Wash U situation because you're playing a good football team as Wash U was. And uh, and then you just you get on them so fast that it they 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 they, they got to sort of absolve themselves of most of their game plan now and, and to go into a different mode and uh, takes a little of the air out of it and and, uh, and then with the way we can play defense you get up by that many the, the chance of them scoring that many to get back in are, are great and so yeah it was uh, it was a whole lot nicer to win that way than <laughs> making it a fourth quarter overtime game. Yeah, and you guys really took advantage of, other than the opening possession, seemed like a short field on almost all of your possessions. That makes yeah. it pretty easy for your offense. Oh, no doubt. I mean, we had two or three interceptions. We had a, a punt that we, we, we tackled a punter. So we had three right there, then a good kick return. So there's four possessions right out of the shoot there under 50 yards. Absolutely. And, uh, and then that allows for scores, which is quick scores. And so before you know it, they were, they were in the hole. How big was it you come out, you take the ball first, and then Stone breaks the big one and puts you up early, knowing you've got an offense that can put up points and runs the fast break and and knowing they're going to move the ball just to know that you've got the first score on the board? Huge, especially, you know, I'm just the guy that hates, I, I defer all the time. I mean, I want I want the ball to start the second half. I just do. I want the ball to start the second half. And, and so, you know, so when you do have to take an opening ball, the opening kickoff, and you don't score, you're already you're behind now. You're behind the chains. They're going to get it before the second half or at the start of the second half. So to be able to do that and to see Stone do it and you know with a big run and that really got him going and into the game. It it was it was big. Obviously, it was a shot of adrenaline and confidence for our kids. How how big has it been for the program and and even for you to get to enjoy a guy like Stone, who's a fifth year senior, had a, had a little bit of a frustrating year last year, but seems to be playing some of his best football here the last couple of weeks. No doubt, you know the kid came off a torn ACL and he's a running back, and it was one of those things where you know he tears it, he has surgery in October. So last year that you know is he back? Well, medically he's back, technically he's cleared, but at that position he's. There was a little confidence lacking, you know, with swell on him every now and then, and so really the year was frustrating on a large portion for a lot of us, and not at Stone, but at the circumstance, and for him especially. And, uh, you know, to have him come back for his fifth year, you know, he wanted to come back and, and be healthy, and, uh, and he is now, and he is playing with a little confidence. You guys, kind of as that game wore on in the first half, Central was able to find their footing a little bit. Finally, they get on the board in the second quarter, almost a goal line stand. But then the offense slowed down. You make a mistake on the punt that led to that. The momentum had kind of swung a little bit back in their direction. And then it comes down to the third down around the middle of the field, and you guys break it for a big touchdown. Talk a little bit about, about that swing and, and how that one kind of wrestled the momentum away from, from what they were building towards halftime because they're getting the ball coming out of the second half. Yeah, yeah, there, there's no doubt it. Um, there was still some confidence, even though they had scored there, it was a short field. And we knew in our heart it was going to take a lot of effort on their part to put together 80 yards. And, uh, but, yeah, to get that score there at that point is, is sort of a little bit of a dagger. And, uh, and so you bet. I mean, it, but even though they, they got that score there, our kids, I mean, that was the first score on our number one since North Central. And so it almost inspired them. It got them... That ain't happening again, type mentality. So some, some people may say, well, now the momentum's back. And I was saying to myself, I'm not so sure. I think <laughs> they just woke, a, you know, as Teddy Roosevelt said, the sleeping giant. So a little bit on that, on that same path, it seemed like the offense, especially in the first half, was atoning for a lot of its sloppiness against Martin Luther there in the first round. They seemed like a determined unit to get things right, and everything in the offense was clicking. The running game was breaking off the big gains that we hadn't seen the week before. The penalties were clean, the, yeah. taking care of the ball. It just felt like the offense was sending a message that last week was not the, the unit that they are. Yeah, that was an aberration. And uh, we made a real serious heart-to-heart -heart challenge to our offense about Turnovers. I said, you, we have got to, we got to do a better job. And then we challenge our whole football team with penalties. I mean, we've been doing it every week, but we just said, okay, now we're 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 in that second round of the playoffs. You know, 15-yard penalties can absolutely kill you, especially when they are a lack of discipline 
we all get frustrated, and everyone wants to push back. And you you got to be disciplined. You just have to be. And I think we only had two penalties that were accepted, so it was huge. And and uh, I don't believe our ones turned it over, so it was a good game. You, we haven't talked a ton about the kicking game because when we talk special teams, it's been a lot about John Bickle. But your kick unit were outstanding again. A couple times, you only had a one or two yard return. And then you guys are at number one in the country in return average and your top ten in coverage. What's really been the key to the to the kickoff return and kickoff coverage games that's allow you guys to be so good in those two units this year? Well, the kick coverage is is two parts. One, we kick the ball in the end zone, so they don't even have a chance for a return. But the second thing is he gets so much height on his kickoffs. And so when you get a high kickoff, it's just not a, a driving kickoff where a guy can catch it with space. It's, it's, it starts to approximate a punt. And so our, the coverage is able to get down there deeper with a guy like Bose. And so that's been huge for us. And, and on return, we, you know, I, we have Coach Brady and, and, and Coach Bowers worked on that, and they, they've taken a lot of pride in it. And they tweak that thing each week. And, uh, um, and we got some guys on that unit that are not, not necessarily, you know, the guys up front are not necessarily um, involved as ones on offense and defense. And so on those two units, they're taking some pride. This is, this is their home run. You know, this is their put the ball in the end zone thing. And so I think that really has probably been the, the, the most important thing is the pride that those kids have taken in those units. Yeah, you kind of teed up by follow-up there. Normally that's been a unit that we've seen be very senior-laden, but this year, you're, you've, last couple years even, you've trusted a couple guys who have been freshmen who yeah. have been special teams aces. Last year it was Caleb Grotolution. This year we see... Kyle Carter made a couple big sticks. Jalen Schaefer is getting involved on that unit. Yeah, Alan, trusting, Jack Allen's out there Yeah, now. trusting yeah. some young guys who are who are really been the strength of this unit. No doubt. And, he, and these are guys, like I said, if that's your only thing, boy, I'll tell you, it's rather that's one of 60 plays or that's one of five plays or a chance to make a name for myself, that's a, that's a good place to be, and that's what those kids are doing. You now turn the page to get ready for a very good St. John's team, a top ten team. But first of all, what's what's it been going through the preparation this week, getting to play December football again? Well, the weather's been incredible. That's the first thing. You know, we've had forty degree weather and no wind and no rain, and you know, it just dips into the thirties by the time practice ends. So the weather has been just fabulous, and and obviously to play football in December. You know, how many teams at any level are doing this at any level, and uh, so. We told our kids to enjoy this and embrace the moment, embrace the practices, and and to uh, and to really throw themselves into it. It's a special moment in time, and uh, you know, absorb it all and, and try to enjoy it. What's it been like getting to do this at home for the first time? And also, you've got a couple guys who played a role in the last quarterfinal run, and O'Connell and, and Nichols and those guys were on the field down at Mary yeah. Hart and Baylor. How much have they kind of been? guiding guys through this process, knowing that they've been there before. Well, I don't know if it's guiding it through the process. Is Those guys know what it felt like to be that far not to get there. So that hunger is what they're instilling, rather than the process of third-round game. It's like, okay, guys, you know, think of what it took to get to this moment in time. Let's not squander this because we're not mentally and physically right. And so the sense of urgency rather than the process is what they have really, you know, introduced to our kids. Obviously, you get to this round, there are no slouches. St. John's no slouch, a quarterfinal team that met the same fate you guys did in 2016 when they were in that round last year. But it, it starts and ends with the guy taking the snap. Yeah. A team that's built relatively similar to North Central when you look at it, but got a very talented quarterback that makes the thing go. Yeah, they are the winner. Um, you know, the, the Division Three Heisman, yeah, he's a good quarterback. He's... He's a tall kid. He stands back there. You know, he's not a guy that's going to like to run and scramble around, but he's going to stand tall in the pocket, find his receivers, and he's going to throw them darts. I mean, he and he likes to go deep with it. He's got a strong arm, and you're going to see some shots taken. You know, they're going to try to go over the top. They really are. Is that maybe the biggest difference in how you prepare for Erdman and comparing to him to Brock Rutter is that he might. He's got a little bit of a stronger arm where he's going to take some shots that maybe Rudder would have checked down to and, and not taken. Yeah, and I don't know if it's necessarily because of arm strength. You know, I haven't really tried to evaluate them both like that. But uh, this guy definitely likes to drive the ball, and Brock will be much more systematic and and go through a progression. And uh, and this guy likes to. He's he's like the old 
John Manholt and Raiders, baby. I mean, he's gonna he's gonna drive the ball downfield on you and, and do it un, unashamedly. How much of having seen North Central's offense this year helps you in preparation for this? Yeah, well, I mean, the offenses are not necessarily a lot alike, but philosophically, they're very much because it's all quarterback centric, and uh, you know that's they're going to get the hands the, the ball in that guy's hands, and they're going to throw it, and they're going to throw it, and they're going to run it. They got good running backs too, and just to keep you honest, but let's just. You, you got you got to do something to slow Brock down, like we had to do, and you got to do something to slow this kid down. You can say anything you want about the run game, yada 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 yada. But if this kid's got time to throw it, and you give him time to stand back there and stand in the pocket and not get any dirt on him, he's he's going to put you in for a long day. They've got two thousand yard receivers. How does that stretch you as you prepare for maybe not just the one, not having one dynamic guy that you've got to worry about a safety over the top of, but having two guys that can match that kind of production? No doubt. I mean, there's, yeah. I mean, they're thousand yard receivers for a reason. Um, one, because they do throw it a lot. You know, it gives them the opportunity. Thousand yard receivers. The other reason is because they are, uh, they're not possession type receivers. Neither of them. Are these inside slot receivers that are finding spines? They're they're both vertical guys, and so, yeah, it creates a challenge. Watching some of that that game last week, it felt like Chapman was able to at least get get Urban off his mark a little bit with guys who are smaller than what than what you bring to the line, and and that was a little surprising because St. John's has a couple talented offensive linemen and. And they've obviously dropped back right. and throw it a lot. But what were you able to see Chapman do that were a, that was able to move him in the pocket and get to him a couple times yeah. with some undersized guys? Well, they, they pressured him with a little bit of uh, success. And then they also showed pressure and backed out with some success. And so, you know, I, I've said this all along that two things got to happen. you got to – if a, quarter, a good quarterback knows what you're going to be in before the ball hits his hands, it doesn't matter what you're in. He'll probably get you. So you, the first thing to do is not let him know what you're in when the ball hits his hand. The second thing is, is shorten the time then he's got to figure it out. <laughs> and so when a guy like that's successful, it's one of two things. He knows right away what you got going. And even if you're going to get the ball out quick, it doesn't matter. Or he might not know, but you can't get to him when he figures you out during the drop. And so you got to do both of those if you're going to shut down the good one. We've talked about the athleticism of your defense. It feels like a lot, but one guy who's kind of flown under the radar because he just shows up and performs every week is Ryan Schwartz, and he had two interceptions against Central. One of those, similar to what you said, was tight to the line and then dropped out, and they thought they had it, and he's athletic enough to drop into that Tampa 2 look and, and get an interception. So how much does that help you as you prepare, knowing that you've got an athlete types that they might not have seen yet this year? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think they've seen a defense quite as fast with overall team speed as ours. I don't know if they've seen one that's quite probably as physical as ours either. Um, but they have athletes that they can respond to that. But, you know, it's it's hard to prepare for something that you really haven't seen before. And so, you know, it's it's going to be a chess match a little bit. But there's no question that, you know, we got to we got to make the quarterback uncomfortable. There's no question. Well, I mean, they know that. I mean, it's not rocket science. I'm not telling you that because I'm some smart guy. I mean... He's the guy. I mean, he won the Gagliardi award. He must be pretty good. How much has your front four kind of taken this challenge of knowing what they've got coming and knowing that it's going to come up to those four guys who have yeah. been so good all year to get there and, and help their defense not have to bring extra guys? Yeah. No, it's going to be huge, and they know it. They know it. And uh, they got a couple of good guys up front to protect, too. But those guys, have, I mean, they've got to, they've, they've got to eat. They really do. But... We're not going to be afraid to bring people either. I mean, that's that's part of the game plan as well. I mean, obviously you like to get there with four is great, but we're, we're not going to live and die off that. You look at them on the other side of the ball, this is a defense that's given up a lot of points, 47 to Aurora, 26 last week to Chapman. It's a defense that looks like it can be had for some games. What do you see from them when you have the ball? Yeah, I think they got the, the thing that impresses me the most, they have two safeties that are, their two safeties are, are ballers, man. They are physical guys, and they like to come downhill, and they don't necessarily like playing deep. And their corners are smooth, pretty athletes. And so those corners are the ones that are they're going to trust to make plays um, on the deep ball, and you're probably going to see a lot of those guys all alone on the islands out there because the safeties are hitters. 
and they're going to come down and they're going to rob and they're going to they're going to make sure that those inside routes if they're caught there's a price that's going to be paid i would say that that's those two kids you know and then one of their de- uh, one of their defensive linemen linebacker type guys is a is an amazing athlete that they they put a lot of different places so they got some players man and and uh you know, so we got to have to obviously you have to be show a lot of different looks, be versatile, and, and uh, try to confuse them a little bit with alignment. Does that help you with having slot receiver types like Matthew Tucker and Philip Nichols that can make them pay for for coming down too aggressively on those inside routes? Yeah, or just they, you can't intimidate those kids. I mean, Philip Nichols is not going to get intimidated. <laughs> I mean, you know, if, if you're going to hit him, and he's going to take the hit. So yeah. Um, no doubt, no doubt there is. And then you can always, you know, get guys come down, you can throw balls over their head as well to the outside receivers. So, I mean, they're, like I said, they're good for a reason, and it's going to be a little bit of a chess match. You guys kind of shuffled your offensive line a little bit, out of necessity with a mid-practice yeah. injury to Joey Pauline and moved Gabe McGill out wide south all to right guard, and all of a sudden the run game kind of took off. Do you see that line kind of being a central figure to maybe being able to establish more of that five, six-yard run game instead of the two, three-yard run game? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the offensive line, Rusty, is people realize it, it's so much of it is working in tandem and working next to each other and being being there. And so, you know, we, we liked Wyatt early, and then Drew broke his leg, and Joey sprained his ankle, and I mean, you got good players in there, but they haven't played together and in the positions you're asking them to play. And so it takes a little bit of time for them to gel, but the second game now that we have, you know, Wyatt at guard now and Gabe at tackle, let them settle in and play with each other. Now this will be the second week of practice, an entire game. You know, hopefully they will, uh, you know, they'll, they'll play in unison and give that running game a little shot in the arm. You guys have been 12 and 0 before, going into two, 2003. How does this kind of stack up to that 2003 experience? Well, I mean, because obviously, first, there's great things about firsts, but wow, yeah. Well, I mean, you think about winning 12 games. I mean, how many teams at any level win 12 football games in one year? At any level, win 12. Very few, and so that is a, a huge accomplishment. And then to win 12 in a row with the chance of getting 13. Is is so exciting, but the thing that makes it different is we're home. We get to be home, <laughs> and playing home is so much fun. Your weekly routine, we, yeah, it's it it, it it provides your players a level of comfort and routine that adds up in a game. Has this week kind of felt like it's? dragging on as this kind of gets closer and closer to game time and time almost slowing down as the anticipation builds for a, a, yeah. a, a well, it's going to be a, a great football game like what we're going to see t- on Saturday. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the work week, you know, the work week is, it, it, you hope, you don't feel like you want it to slow down because there's so many things you want to get in, but when it slows down and it gets a little bit antsy is from the time practice ended yesterday. Because <laughs> then, as you said, all the hay's in a barn now. You know, we have some film session prep, but, I mean, everything's in. So from 6.30 last night until that game, yeah, that's slowing down. That's, that's tough slowing down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind it slowing down during the, early in the week, but now let's put the ball in the dirt and play. Well, Coach, thanks for your time with getting to do this all year, and hopefully we're handing things off to ESPN to do this with you next week. Oh, yeah, you bet.
Good afternoon and welcome inside the press box here at McCauley Stadium. I'm Rusty Lindsay, joined with Doug Rothschild. Hope you've got no plans for the next two and a half hours because you're going to have to buckle it down. We've got a barn burner of a football game coming your way. Wheaton College, 12 and 0, hosting the Johnnies of St. John's University. They enter 11 and 1, the co-champs of the Mayak, and they will they come in boasting one of the better offenses in the nation against one of the better defenses in the nation. Doug, as we start to look at, at this game, first of all, by backing up a week, Wheaton comes off a game where they absolutely blitzed Central College in the first 10 minutes. They led 35 to nothing after nine and a half minutes, kind of coasted the rest of the way. Very similar to the Wash U game, as impressive as we've seen Wheaton, given where they were on the schedule. But this is going to be a whole different kind of contest uh, against what they saw against the Dutch. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, last week's game, you couldn't have asked for a better start. A couple of turnovers, you know, a, a tackled punter, a turnover, and some quick scores, and all of a sudden you're up 35 nothing before the end of the first quarter. So really a, a gift for, for the Thunder, but they did play well. They played hard, so they did earn that. And, you know, people are looking at this game saying, wow, this could be the game of the quarterfinals, and it likely will be, uh, in part because of the transitive property, but that doesn't always <laughs> translate. The transitive property being you know, obviously we just beat Central really badly, who beat the WIAC champion, and uh, one of the WIAC teams obviously was in a one-score game with St. John's at the beginning of the year. St. John's, you know, lost a, an ugly game against Concordia Moorhead. Uh, then they also look at what Mount, what Mount Union and North Central did last week, and they say, wow, the team that just beat Mount Union was beaten by two touchdowns by Wheaton. So all of those things create a lot of hype around a game like this. There should be a lot of hype because it's a quarterfinal. There's only eight teams left. All eight of these teams are great. They are they in the rankings are number two to number nine in the D3.com, uh, D3football.com rankings. Those are the eight teams that are left, which is really impressive. But the transitive property doesn't work all the time. So we see it all the time that you can use that in any number of ways to prove somebody's better than someone else. At the end of the day, you've got two really high-quality teams going at it. It's going to be strength on strength with Erdman and, and this offensive line against this defense. A number four offense in the country against the number one defense in the country. And on the flip side of the ball, you got the number 23 defense and the Johnnies going against the number, I think we're eight, ranked eighth in the country or tenth in the country, depending if you look on scoring or total offense. So there's going to be battles on both sides of the ball. A lot of elite skill players in this game, uh, but really I believe this game will come down to who wins the, the battle in the trenches, our offensive line and our defensive line against the Johnny's offensive and defensive lines. And it does, or it is worth pointing out, this is the first time we open quarterfinal weekends without Mountain Union involved since 1994. So there is a hat to be tipped in a pretty severe manner to North Central, who will host another quarterfinal just seven miles away here. So half the teams in the country are playing in DuPage County this weekend. The one game that is kicked off already is uh, Muhlenberg and Salisbury and the Mules with an early 14 nothing lead over Salisbury and they're about to attempt a short field goal so again we'll keep you updated around the country but this is a Johnny's team that comes in we've, we the focus has always been the high-powered offense but this is a team that had to rally from 10 points down uh, against Aurora in week one and Aurora put up 47 points in that game then they go out to California the offense does its thing again but 26 points put up by a Chapman team that was undersized to this St. John's team so the under look the undercard of this heavyweight bout being St. John's offense against the Wheaton defense on the other side is the St. John's defense has come and given up some points but they've been very good throughout the year that I don't know that they've been playing their best football the last couple weeks well I, I wouldn't look so much about the uh, towards the Johnny score against Chapman that was a 31 to 6 game when the starters left so many of those points uh, many of those points that were scored by Chapman were on the number two defense after the starters had walked out so that, that was also a 41 to 13 game so saying they scored 26 a little bit of a you got to look into the details but there's no question your point is Aurora put up points Aurora had a chance to win that football game with the ball going down the end of the game to win it and that's really the key. On defense, this St. John's team tries to confuse you. They're extremely good on defense. They've got a number of interchangeable parts. They have four all-conference linebackers. They've got six all-conference players on their fronts, um, among their front seven. And they try to confuse you. And if you know who to block, you can score on these guys. The big problem is, is they got big, athletic, fast guys, and they confuse you and they come at you with a number. They'll line six guys up on line of scrimmage and bring any four of them at any given time, and, and you got to know 
your assignment. That's the key. Yeah, they're going to give you a lot of different looks. At the at its base, it's a 3-4 defense, but you'll see Danny Petruszewski, the three-time All-Mayak linebacker, the transfer from the University of Minnesota. He'll walk up into the line quite a bit, and he's a fourth. He's a guy that they have to know where it's at, but that's not to overshadow their other three linebackers because, like you said, they'll move them around. They'll put inside guys outside. This isn't a strict Will, Mike, Sam linebacker system. These are four guys that will line up all over the field, and you just have to know formationally where they're at. Yeah, no question, and you have to you have to understand the concepts of what you're trying to do on offense. Aurora did a great job. They did what's called area blocking a lot of the time, so they just gap blocked everybody. Everybody's got whoever comes inside of you, uh, and and that's one way to do it. But then you end up getting free rushers coming from the outside against Chapman. St. John's did a lot more uh, single blitzing from um, secondary players, bringing a safety, bringing a corner. Uh, bring in um, an outside line, an outside linebacker that's usually a cover guy. Usually they have a group of guys amongst their front seven that are primary rushers. You just don't know where they're coming from. Petrozuski is the guy you got to watch. He use, he's what's called a rush end. So three four defense. You got three down linemen. You got four linebackers, and four linebackers. To, there's two outside linebackers. One's usually a cover guy. One's usually a rush guy. Twenty four is the rush guy. He's rushing ninety five percent of the time. So that's what you got to look for is where's number 24 and where's he rushing. Usually the linebacker outs opposite him is going to be dropping in coverage. 14 and a half tackles for loss, eight sacks for Dana Petruszewski. Let's get to the, ti to the title bout of this game, Wheaton's defense against the St. John offense. And we've seen good offense. Central came in last week with good offense. We've seen North Central who just put up 59 against Mount Union last week. But this, this is a whole different animal with Jackson Erdman. The difference between last year when they made a quarterfinal run and this year is you've got a whole new group of playmakers around him. But this group has gotten better as the year's gone on. He's got two sophomore 1,000-yard receivers. And ultimately, he's the X factor because he's the guy that makes this thing go, and he's the guy that you can never count out in this offense for St. John's. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Jackson Erdman, look, there, there's, a, there's a trophy called the Gallardi Trophy, which is named after ex-St. John's coach, John Gallardi, who's a legend in coaching, coached for 64 years, one of the longest tenures of any coach ever, and they named the MVP trophy of Division Three the Gallardi Trophy. Jackson Erdman is the reigning Gallardi Trophy winner, so he's the MVP of Division Three, and he's a finalist for the award again this year. He could be one of the only ever, I, don't, I can't remember if it's ever happened before, but... Uh, he could be a two-time winner of the Gallardi Trophy. So he is an elite quarterback, and he's elite for a, a couple of reasons. One, he's, he definitely has a team around him. His offensive line is fantastic. We'll talk about that in just a second. But Jackson Erdman can throw the ball, and he can throw the ball a long way with accuracy, and he likes to throw it deep. So he's going to try to throw it deep on you a lot. I mean, he'll throw it deep 15 times a game easily. So And he's very accurate at throwing it deep, and his offensive line gives him time. So if he's sitting back there with time waiting for guys to get open, it's going to be a long day for the Thunder. And this is not only that, but he's a guy that can move in the pocket. They've got to be ready for some scramble drills. When I was talking to Coach Swider after we sat down for the insider, he said Rudder, he might have even mentioned it insider, Rudder's, Rudder's more systematic. He'll go through his reads, once covered, go to two to three to four, and he'll just sit in the pocket and, and let guys develop and find windows. Jackson Erdman will, will make that play happen. He'll move out of the pocket. He'll get guys into scramble drills, something that Wheaton really hasn't seen Probably you've got to go back to Brandon Bauer to see a guy who can be this athletic in the pocket and be this accurate throwing the ball. Yeah, no question. I mean, we're watching him on the far sideline warm up, and if you can see the, the screen, it's kind of far. But he's, he's throwing the ball about 50 yards in the air to another receiver and hitting him right between the numbers on a line. That is super hard to do. You see him here. Uh, he's just got a very strong and accurate arm, uh, and, and he's going to present a unique challenge for this Thunder defense. The bottom line is, this game, as I said at the top, is going to be one up front. Our front four have been as disruptive as any front four I've ever seen at Wheaton College, as disruptive as, as almost any front four I've seen in Division Three, And they're going to have to be disruptive to get Erdman off of his spot because if he stands back there and gets comfortable, they're going to score a lot of points. I think that the other thing is, is is that you almost have to treat it similar to what they do against Brock Rudder. You let him get it, let him get his yards, but you've got to limit the scores. You've got to turn touchdowns into field goals and make the last 20 yards the most difficult part of the field. Well, you look at Mary Harden Baylor in the semis last year, uh, where Erdman went down there into Belton, Texas, and played. And we're familiar with that because the year before we were down there, uh, Mary Harden Baylor is a great defensive team. Um, Erdman threw for 418 yards last year in the semifinal game, but they only scored 18 points, and they scored seven of them with a minute and 50 to go in the game. So Mary Harden-Baylor did a good job of not giving up the big play, 
keeping everything in front of you, coming up and tackling them. And that's what Wheaton's defense is built to, defense is built to do. That is going to be the game plan. Disrupt with four, cover with seven, don't give up the big play. Erdman wants to push the ball. The question is, will Erdman get frustrated? If he gets flustered and they get to him, is he going to start to scramble? And Concordia, he threw four interceptions, and a lot of those were just chucking the ball to get out of pressure. And so if the Thunder can create that environment, then you've got a game. If, you, if not, if he can sit back there and pick you apart, it's going to be a long day. Third phase of this game comes down to special teams. This is where Wheaton has a decided edge in this game between the, the, the punting of John Bickle, both for distance and pinning teams deep, and also because St. John's has struggled with the kicking game. They've gone through a rotation of kickers. They finally settled on Colin Coomer, but he's still only one for four this year on field goal attempts. So if this game comes down to needing to make kicks, this is an area where Wheaton, especially in the kicking game with Griffin Bowes, has become better in recent weeks. But this is Wheaton's biggest advantage comes in special teams. No question. I mean, Concordia beat St. John's. They had a huge kick return uh, that got them deep in the territory they ended up scoring off of. They only scored uh, 19 points. I think the final score was 19 to 18 or something like that. And then they blocked an extra point and ran it back for a two-point score. So that resulted in nine of, you know, half of their points in a, in a game that they won. And the kicking game is definitely something that St. John's fans are uh, concerned about. They've stabilized it over the last few weeks, but it could be a big, it could be a big factor today. Uh, if the consistency isn't there. Looking at the big picture, three other games going on. We mentioned Muhlenberg, 17 to nothing, leading over Salisbury right now. North Central will host Delaware Valley over at Benedetti Worley Stadium. The winner of this game is going to get the winner of Mary Harden Baylor and UW Whitewater. And that's a game where if Mary Harden Baylor is the winner, the winner of this game will head to Belton, Texas. If Whitewater is the winner, I believe both of these teams, whoever comes out of this game, would get a home game next week should UW Whitewater get a win there. But we've got a whole lot of war to settle between before we get to that one as Wheaton is coming out of their locker room to our right. St. John's has been on the field for probably five minutes now. And uh, we're getting set both for the coin toss and the national anthem today. Doug, give us, give us your big three keys uh, for, for this game and who, as we can start to separate these two teams. Well, I think the, the headline uh, offense of St. John's against the defense of the Thunder, you know, St. John's has to protect Erdman and the Thunder have to get pressure. So can the front four for Wheaton get home without bringing an extra guy? As soon as you bring an extra guy, you're going to have uh, pressure problems. We're going to cut you off there and send things down to the track. National anthem today being sung by Wheaton sophomore Michael Mendez. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free and the home of the Wheaton sophomore Michael Mendez with the national anthem today as we get ready now for the coin toss. Wheaton's captains and St. John's captains getting ready to, to meet in the midfield W. And Doug, we kind of cut you off after your first key. What are your last two big keys for this game? So first big play, big key, as I just mentioned before the anthem, is the offensive and the defensive line play on both sides. Whoever wins the line of scrimmage, ultimately that's going to be determined, go a long way to figure out who wins a game. The next one for the, for the Wheaton offense They've got to identify 
who the rushers are for the St. John's defense. St. John's runs a 3-4, four, four linebackers, interchangeable, a lot of confusion. They move around. They, they bring four or five, and in the, amongst their front seven, they'll bring a different four or five every time. They'll line a lot of them up, and it's just hard to identify them, and they're all very athletic, and they will get after you. So if you can identify who the right guys are and block them, you're going to have opportunities in the passing and the running game. And final, gentlemen. Good morning. My name is Tony. I'll be a referee. And on the flip this side, Brian, he's getting some big plays by identifying those Here's who those coin. guys are. The Marine logo is heads. Uraz tails. Your opportunity to Tarini and Nichols heads, and tails. the receivers Saint for the John's Thunder. St. John's is a visiting team. Adam Tarini was pretty quiet Tails last week called. after he had been on a on a tear. But you have seen Philip Tails Nichols coming back from that Achilles Wait, injury. He's got three touchdowns in the first round against Martin Luther. Two touchdowns last week against Central. So we'll see what Saint Phil John's Nichols has for an encore here in the quarterfinals. So it looks like Wheaton won the toss and will defer to the second half. So St. John's will start the game with the ball, and that excites Jackson Erdman as he skips off the field, as it should. So, the uh, number four ranked so. offense in the country uh, is going to want to get its shot against this number one offense. So it'll be headliner to start this game, certainly. And uh, we're in for, I think, what's going to be an epic Division Three football game. Strength on strength, and it's going to come right out of the gates. The number one defense in the country against the reigning Division Three Player of the Year in Jackson Erdman. I'm Rusty Lindsay, joined by Doug Rothschild. Thanks for joining us here on the Wheaton Thunder Sports Network. We're going to have what we hope is the best quarterfinal uh, of the four games being played today for you. Wheaton hosting St. John's for the third straight week. It's a whole lot of red and black in the stands on the other side of McCauley Stadium and a whole lot of blue and orange filling in underneath of us here in what should be a packed house. Wheaton will kick right to left. Beautiful day. First weekend of December. This is probably the best weather we've had for any of these three home playoff games. Temperatures in the low to mid 40s. Wind gusting up to 10 miles an hour. It'll move almost corner to corner. So as you're looking at the field here from the far right to the near left, uh, but it really shouldn't make too much of a difference. Watching the quarterbacks throw pregame, ball seemed to travel about the same. Didn't see a whole lot of wobble either direction. And uh, I think you're going to have as good a weather as you can ask for for December 7th. Yeah, no question. Uh, you get, we got a great audience here at the field and also around D3. There's just eight, four games left and eight teams. The number two through number nine of the Division3.com, uh, D3Football.com rankings are left in these playoffs. And there's viewers from all around the country, including down in Texas, uh, where the Thunder Hope or the Johnny's Hope, whoever wins this game, will be traveling next week or certainly in two weeks. That's the goal. Griffin Bowes will tee this thing off. Wheaton in the blue tops, white bottoms, white numbers edged in orange. The all-white look for St. John's for the second week in a row. And the ball blows off the tee. The very classic numbers on the helmets for St. John's. Johnny's across the back. So this will have to be a hold used by Caleb Egbert as Griffin Bowes had to use this a little bit last week with, with some of the wind gusts against Central, and now Egbert goes back out to the gunner spot, and we're ready to go. Two men deep for the Johnnies as Bowes booms this one over their head and through the back of the end zone. The blood pumping pretty good for Griffin Bowes as that'll be touchback. Number 40 on the year for Griffin Bowes. A couple guys to watch here. The St. John's, the, the MIAC lineman of the year is left tackle Ben Barch, a six foot six, 305 pound senior. He's as good as an offensive lineman as you're going to see at this level. He's a pro, pro prospect. Uh, whether he gets there or not, we don't know. He'll definitely get somewhere based on his potential, but he's a phenomenal player and leads this front and has a couple of other All-Americans. Dan Heck, a th what will probably be a three-time All-American at right guard. First play, Erdman on a play fake. Sets up, looking over the middle. Now he's going to dump into the flat to Kai Barber. Makes the catch, gets across the 25, lowers his shoulder out of bounds, across the 30 to the 31, but that's what you want. You want to take away the big play and force him down underneath. Well, that's what the, the Thunder are going to want to do, and this exact thing is what Erdman's going to have to do early in this game is go to check downs and just take what the Thunder give him and he's going to throw for a lot of yards doing that uh, the key is will he get frustrated and try to push the ball down the field into a coverage situation Robbie Alston one of their 1,000 yard receivers in the middle of a trip set TJ Hodge the other inside give his to Barber and he will run into the line now finds a seam and squeaks forward to the 30 Two, give him the 33, and it'll be third and two for two of the better third down units in the nation. 
Again, the, that front f five for St. John's, Ben Barch, Carl Rude, Nick Newman, a two-time All-Mayak selection, Dan Greenheck, and Josh Jouer. Four seniors, the junior Newman in the middle. The tight end, number 84, Jack Kempner. And you'll see him on the right side of the line. Five wide receivers. Trips bunch to the left side. Motion comes from Trost on a pitch sweep. Going to be chased by McRae. Tries to bounce. He gets the first down and will be rode down at midfield by Wyatt Lee. But Trost is a guy that, like you talked about early, Doug, if you see him in a spread set, they want to get him the ball. Yeah, and that's vulnerable. The, the Thunder are vulnerable in that situation because uh, St. John's does a good job blocking the perimeter. So that jet sweep, you get out on the perimeter, against the Thunder and uh, get everybody locked, locked up inside, you're going to have opportunity on the outside there. Blake Patrick and TJ Hodge split to the right side, two by two, the wide receivers. First and ten for the Johnnies at midfield. Play fake, quick hitter to the outside to Matt Moore, and Moore is going to be pushed out of bounds. We'll see where he stepped out. It'll be a gain of four. But again, these, they've got the playmakers. They want to get them the ball in space and work before Wheaton can rally that team speed to get there. And you can see early the game plan. Thunder trying to protect from any big plays, let the front four get home. And it's going to take a while to get into it. And Erdman and St. John's taking what the defense gives them, just throwing these little quick hitters out wide, taking the four, five, six yards, moving the ball down the field. Five wide receivers. Hodge, the inside guy of a trip set. Looking right is Erdman. He's going to throw the quick one to Matt Moore. He's got a first down and pushed out of bounds down around the 35-yard line. That's where they'll mark the football, another first down. But again, Wheaton giving them plenty of space, and they're getting the ball out fast enough before that front four can get there. A lot of patience from this Johnny offense, which you'd expect from an Erdman, the Gallardi uh, Trophy, reigning Gallardi Trophy winner, being very patient right now. One back in the backfield, four wide receivers with a trip set left as Caden Sigler rolls high. Corey Kennedy walked down over the top of T.J. Hodge. First and ten from the 35. Looking to the right side is Erdman. Hitch, now he's pushed out by Pat O'Connell, and the pass is going to skip into the wide receiver. Should be incomplete, and there's the call. But nice pressure from Pat O'Connell to get the first hit of the day on Jackson Erdman. And again, you see him go three wide to the top, single down to the bottom. They want to come back to that single tie side on quick game. They try to get guys underneath on slant, but they had Wyatt Lee cheating out to sit underneath that stuff. Took it away. Erdman had to go to his secondary read, and the, the front was able to get home. That's going to be a fun matchup to watch. Ben Barch, the All-American, against Pat O'Connell, a three-time All-North region honoree. Second and ten from the 35, two by two. Erdman communicating with his wide receivers here. Just under three minutes into this game, first possession of the game. Pressure comes from Wyatt Lee. Erdman on the quick hit to Moore. It's right through his hands and incomplete. And a big play early in this one, third and ten for the Johnnies from the Wheaton 35-yard line. It is a big play. Third down has been an area of specialty for the Johnnies. They're one of the best in the country at converting, but it's third and long. They're used to something a little shorter than that. Another thing to note, not much of a running game, just a couple of runs so far. Johnnies are typically 50-50, pretty very close to 50-50 run versus pass. Been a lot of pass and about two runs so far. Wheaton fourth in the country in Rhett and third down defense, giving up conversions just 23% of the time. Four wide, five wides. Erdman looking left on a quick hitter. It's complete. That'll be a first down to Ravi Alston, and the hit made by Ryan Schwartz to bring him down at the 20 yard line. Those are his guys. Alston, number three, 71 catches for 1,200 yards coming into this game. And the other guy is TJ Hodge, number 11, who's often in the slot. Comes in with 68 receptions for over 1,000 yards. So 2,000-yard receivers on this offense and several, many other weapons that have caught a lot of passes. So Erdman's got a lot of weapons around him. Ball almost came loose there at the end of that play on the hit from Schwartz. Austin covering it up. And this is where we talked about. Give him his yards until you get to the red zone and make the last 20 the hardest. Two by two wide receivers. Just over three minutes in here as now Patrick and Hodge switch on the line left side. Erdman back. Com com Protected well, now breaking through. Missed tackle by Holiday, going to the end zone, and that ball is caught. Touchdown, Johnnies. Jake Holiday had a shot in the backfield to bring down Erdman, and Erdman slipped his grasp and throws a bullet to the end zone. Touchdown, St. John's. And Holiday knows it too. He had him, and that's <clears throat> that's been the genius of Erdman as he keeps his eyes down the field with pressure. He's able to move around. He does a great job there, buying a little bit more time. And he's a big, strong guy. You know, six foot four, 215 pounds. He's not easy to bring down. He's not going to come down with an arm tackle. There does a good job, and the the receiver was covered. That's a story you will see Erdman do all the time. Spencer Rowland had great coverage on the receiver, and he threw it down there, and the 
uh, Spencer Rowland, Rowland didn't get his head around, and the receiver had his eyes on the ball and was able to catch it. Ravi Alston ends up coming down with the catch, as here you see, actually that was River Schindeldecker who uh, had the miss here and had Holiday coming in for the second pressure. Wheaton with, with good defense, and Rowland just didn't see the ball, and Alston makes the play. Again, similar to the start against North Central, you've seen North, North Central went down and scored on the first drive of the game, up 7 nothing, and Wheaton had to come back and respond. So that this is a situation that the Thunder have been in before, but it's no surprise that Erdman and this number four ranked offense went down and got points on the board. This is going to be a, a battle, and now it's Wheaton's turn to try to answer. So the kicking duties to be done by Austin Solers for St. John's. He will kick left to right, and we'll see how much how much the wind played into the touchback by Bose, who boomed the opening kickoff through the end zone. Well, the Thunder uh, receiving team is up. The receivers are up just inside the 10, just about the 7-yard line. Magnuson and Matthew Tucker are deep, and this is going to bring Tucker all the way up to the sideline at the 18, 25-30. Matthew Tucker to the 35, and the freshman's going to set Wheaton up just shy of the 40. He's been electric in kickoff returns so far this year, and he makes a nice play to set Wheaton up for their first drive of the game. As you watch this St. John's defense, they are a 3-4 three, front. Three down linemen with their hand on the ground, four linebackers standing up. Number 24 is the outside linebacker who will be coming most of the time. They usually run two deep safeties or a cover three, which is three deep defensive backs. And they're going to set up with Tom John Kohler over the top, the sophomore out of Birchwood, Wisconsin. Roll Luke Anthony on first down. Sets up, wants to take a shot. Has a man down the sideline, and that ball is incomplete. A lot of fighting down the rail to Adam Torini. Well covered by Tommy Dieters as Jesse Scott trying to take a big play on the first play from scrimmage. Yeah, he's just trying to get those DBs to be very conscious. St. John's has a defensive back that they like to sit down at about 12 yards, even the safeties who are deep, and just jump on all the routes. And so he's just trying to create a little bit of space in there to work later in the game. Good coverage from Peters. Kohler also coming over the top. Bobbled snap. Give us to T.J. Williams. He'll bounce to the outside. Flag comes down. T.J. trying to turn the corner, and he will just roll into the St. John's sideline. But I think you've got a hold here against the Thunder. Yeah, the Thunder, one of the more penalized teams in Division Three. Uh, they're, they're averaging Holding nine or ten points. Offense play. number 69. 10-yard penalty. Second down. That's right tackle Clay Wagner getting called for the hold there. Again, Wheaton, one of the more penalized teams in Division Three. They've been able to overcome it, but in games like this, it's going to become critical that you don't operate behind the sticks, which they're going to find themselves here against the number 23 ranked defense in the country. Jesse Scott talking to him before the game, the offensive coordinator for the Thunder, said this is the best defensive front that we have seen all season. So this offensive line has its work cut out for them. Seniors Kyle Borgeson and J.W. Windsor, the junior Dom Nussmeyer, the down lineman. Quick hitter to Torini, knocked down at the line and falls incomplete, just trying to get that quick slant. And it looked like Windsor might have got his hand up on that ball over the middle. Yeah, and they find themselves in a, in a really treacherous situation here early. Third down and 20 against this defense and facing the prospects of, you know, you got to be conservative here. You don't want to do anything stupid. But punting the ball back to uh, Erdman is not something you want to necessarily do either. So, But that's the situation they're facing. they got to take their medicine. Be smart with the ball right here and take what the defense gives them. Trips left, Nichols, Tucker, and Lean. Split right is Torini, Stone, Watson in the backfield on third and 20. For Luke Anthony, four-man rush. Pressure breaks through with Neusmeyer. Drop down underneath for Stone Watson. It looked like it was tipped by Nick Jensen. And a, uh, a not a great start for the Wheaton offense. And now we'll see John Bickle going to have a big role in what, what the next chapter is as this game unfolds. Great start by the Johnnies. They've got to be extremely pleased coming out and getting seven from their first drive and then going three and out for the Wheaton Thunder. And this is exactly the start that they would want on the road down here in this quarterfinal matchup. So Bickle, the Mayak transfer, started his career at St. Thomas. Will knock this one away. Good snap back from Barber. And this ball is driven. Going to be caught at the 30 by Hodge. And Hodge will just step into the Wheaton sideline about a yard ahead of where he caught it at the 32. A nice punt, but good field position for St. John's in their second offensive go-round here as you bring out this... Uh, Prolific St. John's offense. The defense is going to get a stop here. We'll see if we, 
See if Wheaton can make some adjustments after Erdman got whatever he wanted there on that first drive. They will send Moore and Austin to the right side. Four wide receivers leaving Hodge and Patrick to the left side. Wheaton brings four. Erdman sits cleanly in the pocket and overthrows Ravi Austin on the out route. So Erdman will occasionally just throw some errant balls like that even to open guys. He doesn't always hit the open guy, but he's been very lethal in terms of percentages. He career completion percentage of 64%, uh, which is really good. By contrast, those of you who understand North Central's offense, Brock Rudder's been completing at around 72%, which is just insane. But Erdman throws the ball down the field a lot more. They're very different quarterbacks. Erdman, 64% is an incredible amount with 4,291 yards coming into this game. Second and 10, and Erdman will drop under center for the first time. Motion comes from Moore. They'll give up the middle to Barber, who's swallowed up by Dallas McRae. Help coming at the end, and they will knock him back for a yard. Dallas McRae, the CCIW Defensive Player of the Year, swallowing that one up. And it'll be third and 11 for the Johnnies. And the Thunder bringing in an extra linebacker and an extra defensive back. Holiday comes out, and Gamicha comes out. So you go with Schindle, Decker, McRae, and O'Connell up front. Grota Lucian will play in the, in the safety role here. Trips to the left side, Alston isolated right. They will bring pressure. And he goes over the middle, high for Alston. It's completed, and a really strong tackle made by Caden Sigler. That's going to bring him down a yard short. Sigler having to make a play in space, and he does. And he gets St. John's off the field. Really a great stop. Set up by Dallas McRae's penetration on second down to tackle him for a yard for that yard, and that's the yard that they needed here as they come up just a yard short of the first down, forcing a punt. So the Thunder holds serve here, and they're able to get a stop and get the ball back. Sigler, the all-CCIW safety, second team this season. And we'll see Cole Mills, the freshman, to make his first kick of the game. Wheaton brings pressure up the middle. It's a high spiraling kick, not a lot of distance, and it will be caught by Tucker at the 24-yard line. All right, so the Thunder, having seen this Johnny defense, now get a chance to adjust. And St. John's runs a defense structurally that's very similar to Wash U for those CCIW followers, a 3-4 defense with a lot of flexibility and multiple looks. I think this is a very stout defense. Dan Petruz, excuse me. Be Petruszewski, I Petruszewski. believe, is what you're looking for. I apologize <laughs> to the St. John's fans. I will get there. Petruszewski is, a, is the playmaker of this front seven, but they've got playmakers across the board. Anthony will stretch to Stone Watson, and Watson gets past the line of scrimmage, gets elevated a little bit to get himself to the 29-yard line, and that'll be a gain of four on first down. Stone Watson, who ran 10 times for 100 yards last week and a touchdown against Central. I was going airborne, actually gained him a yard trying to go over the pile there. Second and six, Caleb Brink checks into the formation inside of Phil Nichols. And Torini splits to the right side. Watson into the flat to the left side, and that ball is completed, and Watson will stretch it across the 35. Should be enough to move the chains, and it will. That's a look we saw against North Central where they just moved the running backs quickly into the flat for an easy pitching catch. Yeah, you just flood the pass. Two receivers release a little bit, and you put the back into the flat. The safety's trying to break up on him, and he's a good one, but he doesn't get there quite in time to get the first down. Again, this offensive line shuffled last week, so that's Gabriel McGill at left tackle. Makes a nice cut block. Fake pitch sweep. Anthony's going to set up. Goes into the flat again to Nichols, who has to slide down and make the catch across the 40 to the 41, but now you're starting to see the Wheaton offense find its rhythm the second time out. Yep, starting to figure out a little bit where guys are. And again, the key with this defensive front is to figure out who to block. If you can get them blocked, there's going to be opportunities. And there you saw that. We got him outflanked there. That was the outside linebacker uh, who Nichols outflanked James Inman. Nichols and Torini both threatening 1,000 yards coming into play today. Nichols at 878, Torini at 925. Second down give is to Will Smith. And the Fresh Prince rumbles ahead. He's going to come up a yard shy of the first down marker. So it brings up a big third down. The Thunder have been very good on third down this season, and the Johnnies are going to want to try to get a stop here. This be interesting to see what happens as one of the Thunder offensive linemen, Joe Polina, comes out of the game. Well, Polina coming back and in comes here. Right back well, in. they're going to go with the center package. This is Jake Hibben setting up in the backfield ahead of Will Smith. So Polina comes in at left tackle. That's Will Smith, the deep back. Give us to Will Smith, and Will Smith will power, but nope. he's going to come up just short. And that penetration came over that left side of the line, 
where Paulino was. That's yeah. big number 93, Faulu making the play, and Wheaton's keeping the offense out there for now. That's the guy Paulino was trying to block, so he's going to, Swider will punt this. He, it would be shocking to me if they went for this. This is not his um, style this early in the game. Well, this looks like a move to keep the punt return unit off the field for St. John's. They had to get defense on. Now, they do have a trip set left, and they're going to have to hurry to get this thing off because Wheaton likes to bring jet motion, and they do get it off. So Bickle will pound this one away. High spiraling kick on a drop Hodge all the way back. It checks up at the five and rolls into oh, the man. end zone. Bickle's been so good. It was surprising last week when he had a touchback. He's punted now 48 times, and he's had just four touchbacks now. Yeah. Meanwhile, he's pinned nine punts inside the five-yard line. Great job there by the, uh, by the Johnny offense. And again, Paulino's trying to get off the field. He had a little bit of a bum ankle. But because Hibben was in on that package, his backup was also in. He had to stay in. He ends up getting beat across his face to lose a yard when he needed a yard, and that results in a punt. So these are little things, but they all add up in a quarterfinal game. More motions down on first and 10 for the Johnnies. All under pressure is Erdman trying to get himself out of the pocket. He's going to run. Pressure comes from behind, and the ball looked like it came out for a second, but is quickly smothered up. Schindeldecker makes the play from behind for only a yard. And it's worth, as you mentioned, when Wheaton was running this package early, McGill was the guard. So you would bring in, uh, I believe it was Wyatt Southall, move Sam Rogers down, and you only had one move. Now you've got to move Gill back to guard, bring Paulina in a tackle, move Rogers down, and move Hibben into the backfield. So there's a lot more moving parts now to that package. And if Paulina can't go, then that takes that package effectively out of play. Second and nine after the gain of a yard for Erdman on the scramble. 540 left first quarter. Johnny's leading 7 nothing. Isolated to the right side is the tight end Kempner. They give and tripping is Trost. And Wyatt Lee was slanting in to get there. Dallas McCray saw on the ground in the backfield wondering where a flag is. Well, but, but again, it's third and long. That's Dan Greenhack who buried him after the play's over. But again, third and long, and that's where you want to keep St. John's. Yeah, this is the down and distance that they want to be in. They're trying to get their nickel subs in and get the right calls going. No back set. This is a common look. Number 11 on the line means he's going vertical in this set right here. That's T.J. Hodge. Pressure's coming. Wheaton's got him outnumbered. Irvin's thrown off the back foot, and this just going to be thrown in the Wheaton sidelines. C.J. Nightingale dialed it up perfectly, and we'll see if Wheaton can swing the field now in the punt return game. Nice job by the Thunder defense. So both defenses holding serve early after an early drive by Erdman and company to go up 7 to nothing. 4.52 to go in the first. We got the battle we thought. If the Thunder can catch this ball and get a little bit of a return, they could be in business on the St. John's side of the field with for their first real scoring opportunity. Over in Naperville, North Central leads Delaware Valley early on a touching, rushing touchdown by Ethan Greenfield. So good to see for the Cardinals. Greenfield is back this week after he went down in the fourth quarter. High snap. They're going to check up the return. Short punt by Cole Mills. It bounces at the 40. It takes a Johnny bounce. That should be about the 47-yard line as they tried to just knock that ball further. But two officials were on it with the beanbags, and Wheaton's going to start just shy of midfield. So their best starting field position of the day for the Thunder, this number eight ranked offensive team for the Wheaton Thunder led by Luke Anthony who comes in as the number three rated passer in the nation from passing efficiency behind only D'Angelo Fulford of Mount Union and Brock Rutter of North Central. He's averaged 67% of it, completing 67% of his passes throwing for 2,600 yards this year. Four wides, two by two as Torini motions down on the left side. They will give to T.J. Williams. Williams trying to bounce to the outside, and now he's just going to lower his head and try to get as close to the line of scrimmage as he can, but that was well defended by St. John's on first down. And that's a play you can run, but you really have to start that downhill because all of these, these linebackers for St. John's want to come underneath blocks. They want to try to spill everything, but you have to run at the line of scrimmage to get them to do that. If you're running wide, they're not going to come under. They're just going to chase you, and they have a lot of speed. Alex Sias, the guy who bounced that ball coming through unblocked, as now Anthony is going to assess the defense. Four, three wide, excuse me, Torini to the left on second and 12. Counting down on four minutes left first quarter, a 7-0 Johnny lead after they took the opening drive 75 yards. Four-man rush into the flat to T.J. Williams, who is knocked out of bounds for maybe a yard, and it'll be third and long now for the Thunder. 
Yeah, again, this is really hard to identify who to block, and you're only bringing four. They end up bringing an unblocked player, and you don't react. So you get pressure in Anthony's face. That's the key to the game. St. John's defense is built on, they've got a lot of power and speed, but confusion. They've got interchangeable parts. They're going to bring four or five different guys, and you just have to identify who they are. That was Luke Rogers who got caught looking outside while a guy came unblocked inside of him. So third and 11 as Nichols motions across the formation. Now they bring pressure. Anthony trying to get out of it. He does. Rolling to the right side. Broken play here. Anthony throws to the sideline to Torini, and Torini is pushed out of bounds at the 45-yard line. Good job by Luke Anthony getting out of that, but that's going to bring up a fourth down, and the Thunder will punt. Swider content in this situation to play field position, especially with a weapon like Bickle as a punter. He's going to try to pin him deep. But the scramble drill, the receivers, one, the, the guy you're running towards is supposed to come back. The guys towards the middle and the backside are supposed to break deep. So Nichols really needed to break deep in that situation, give him an outlet to go to to try to pick up the first. Well covered by the Johnnies. J.W. Windsor, the guy who had him in his grasp, and then Anthony escaped. So Bickle... High end over end kick. We'll see where this bounces. It bounces at the 12, and his angle's perfectly out of bounds at the 5. There he is. Actually, they'll give him the 7, as that's the Bickle special. Punt number, I have to look this up. That's Mick Bickle's 16th punt of the year inside the 10 yard line. Yeah, he is one of the best punters in the nation. If, you've, if those Thunder fans that have been watching him, we've seen him do that all year long. He is one of the best at pinning people inside the 20. Swider knows that. He wanted to do that with this defense and see if they can get a stop and just get a new set of downs on the St. John's side of the 50. That would be the goal. But again, we've had one long drive for the St. John's offense, and the rest has been a defensive battle here in the first quarter. Quickly around the country, Muhlenberg 17-0 over Salisbury North Central, 7-0 over Delval, Whitewater 3-0 over Mary Harden Baylor. Quick hit on first down to Moore, and Moore's going to power ahead and knocked out of bounds shy of the 15 at the 14-yard line. So they just take to what the defense gives them, and it nets seven yards. Yeah, they'll, I mean, if you're an offense corner, you'll take seven yards coming out of your own, uh, your own end inside the 10 every time. So that, that's a great result for them. Second down, they got a lot of opportunities. They can play action here on second and short. Uh, they can just try to pound it in there and try to get the first down. We'll see what they do here. Usually they, out of this set, they're going to try to run the ball towards number 88, the tight end. They will pitch sweep to Trost, and Wheaton's got it well pursued, but he cuts it back. He's going to be stopped about a yard shy of the first down, and he might actually have it rolling forward through yep, the tackle. Wheaton, gave had, it to him. Wheaton had it well pursued out of the gates, but he found a cutback lane and got the three yards needed. Tyler Johnson is a tight end, number 88, and when he lines up in that type of a set, they like to run the ball to him. Jack Kempner is a starting tight end. He catches the ball. He has 17 catches on the year, so they like to throw it to, to Kempner and run it towards Tyler Johnson, and there we saw the run. They were actually both set up that way as a tight end and a wing, and they ran the pitch and got the first down. Nice job for the offense. First and 10 at the 17-yard line. Wheaton will bring four as Erdman sits in the pocket, steps up now and dumps it off to Barber, who is wrapped up immediately by Ryan Schwartz. Schwartz sitting in the middle of that defense, came downhill quickly, and it's a two-yard gain. Nice job there by Schwartz, sitting on that route and coming up. And, and I know Erdman in his head in practice, the Johnny's coaches work with him to have a, a count in his head, how long he has the ball in his hands before he's either got to take off or get rid of it. And uh, he's done a good job managing the game so far there. He just took it to the, gave it to the running back on a check down and uh, lived to play the next play. 8 of 11 for 91 yards for Erdman. Quick hitter to T.J. Hodge. Wheaton's all over it. He might have got a yard. All over it, the pursuit from the inside. O'Connell got out there. Lee Gamicha. It'll be third and seven here for the Johnnies. And this is the big one for Wheaton because you've got to keep the field position slanted yeah. in, your, in your favor. And that bunch set is how they wanted to play. They want DBs outside of that little four or three wide receiver bunch set because they feel like on those quick passes they have a defensive front that can pursue down the line and get there. And the defensive backs need to maintain outside leverage to keep everything in on those little quick out bubble passes that you see like that and try to let those defensive linemen pursue. Play clock down to 10 as St. John's jogs out to the formation. It's at five and they're still not set. They're gonna have to hurry. Erdman looking over the defense, snap is back at one. Pressure comes up the middle, it's a screen to Moore, and Moore's going to have the first down and Moore out across the 30. Wheaton brought pressure, and St. John's anticipated it well, running that quick screen to the outside. Yeah, the quick game, Erdman getting the ball out of his hands against pressure, and that's the risk that you run. 
these little rub things, and then you got a blocker there on the quick screen pass. And uh, it's just execution. They did a better job executing there to get the first. Pat O'Connell makes the tackle from behind quickly to the line. Flag comes up. Free play for St. John's. They're going to take the shot. They've got it. This is going to go to the house. Robbie Schwartz got caught watching, and it's going to be a touchdown for St. John's. A huge mistake by Schwartz, who stopped his feet, watched the ball. Instead of continuing to pursue, they'll, they'll decline the penalty, and St. John's with a two-score lead. And, and that's what the Thunder, Thunder coaches are most afraid of. That's what their, their defense is designed to prevent. Offsides, defense number 90. The penalties decline. Result, touchdown. River Schindeldecker, the guilty party. I think they probably could have got either Holiday or McRae there in the middle. But the presence of mind from Erdman to take the shot, knowing that he had a free play. And just before the first quarter runs out, St. John's adds to its lead. Well, the thing you don't realize when you when you haven't played a, a guy like Erdman and the, a team like St. John's, he throw you can see it on tape. He throws the ball deep, but if you haven't had guys running by you for uh, you know with the the speed and size of these guys, you're just not used to it. And Robbie Schwartz just got caught a little bit flat-footed, and that's a liability for the Thunder. They, they've built this defense to not give up those big plays, and here they give one up to Erdman who does a great job. He's one of the most accurate deep throwers you will see in college football. And there you see he puts him in stride. Many quarterbacks make that quarter make that guy come back for it or throw it a little bit long, especially when you got gusting wind. Great job by Erdman showing why he's the All-American that he is. That was Blake Patrick, the junior out of St. Stephen, Minnesota, making the catch and run. And so we'll see how Wheaton responds. They have not trailed in the postseason, and now they're trailing by two scores. They actually haven't trailed, I believe, since the North Central game. So it's been since October 5th. It's been two months. Well, the, the, the other thing you look at is you, you look at this St. John's offense and all the weapons, and you're looking for Ravi Alston. You're looking for T.J. Hodge and Jack Kempner. You're looking for guys like Matt Moore. Uh, but you, you have a guy like Blake Patrick who is a junior, but he's only caught nine balls coming in this entire year. So that's less than one a game. And here, you know, so you're thinking as you look at the personnel who you're worried about, and that's not one of the guys you're worried about, and there he beats you, and that just shows you how many weapons this team has. Solers knocks this one away. It's going to be taken at the 15, full head of steam for Nate Magnuson. Magnuson spins off a tackle at the 30, and he'll be wrapped up at the 31 and dropped there by Ryan Lacasse. Again, you see guys like Ryan Lacasse, the starting safety on special teams. And in the playoffs, that's what these games mean, quarterfinals. That's you're one of the, the first quarter. You're one of the last eight teams standing. You're putting your best players on special teams. So you got Ryan Lacoste, who is a, a stud on this on this defense, an all Mayak player, running down on a kickoff and making a tackle. So 14-0 our score at the end of the first quarter. It's also 14-0 in Naperville, where North Central has added with a touchdown pass from Rudder to D'Angelo Hardy. And that's going about as well as we thought it would for Delaware Valley early on as Rudder 7 of 7. Muhlenberg continues to lead Salisbury 17 to nothing. And Whitewater 3 nothing early in the second quarter over Mary Harden Baylor. Erdman finishes the first quarter 11 of 14 for 172 and two touchdowns. Luke Anthony coming out on the field after he went 3 for 5 for 13 yards. And Wheaton played behind the chains for a lot of that first quarter. Yeah, this Thunder offense has got to get on track. You've heard the old adage of Mike Tyson saying that everyone has a plan until you get punched in the mouth, and the Thunder have just been punched in the mouth by a, an elite team, and we'll see how they answer. Give straight ahead to T.J. Williams. He's going to be tripped up by Petrzewski, but not before he falls forward for a four-yard gain. Petrzewski is a... 6'3", 245-pound junior, comes in with 57 tackles, including 14 and a half tackles for loss and eight sacks. He is the most decorated of, these def of this defensive front and one of their best playmakers. And this first half stats going to be pretty one-sided. We'll get to those in just a second. Second and six here from the 33 as they will feed T.J. Williams again. Cuts up field, has a seam. He's going to be just shy of the first down as that's another five-yard gain for T.J. Williams. Brings up a third and short, which the Thunder have not yet converted, and so it's important that they try to get one here. They'll bring in Stone Watts in their third down back. St. John's in that first quarter, 172 yards passing, 177 yards total. Thunder just seven plays for 15 yards. 
Third and a yard, they're going to run option to the right side. Anthony's going to tuck his head and get the first down out across the 40. Not a look we've seen a whole lot of from Wheaton. Just straight speed option to the edge with Stone Watson, and Anthony tucks it for two. That's a nice job by Luke, just making that decision to get the first. It's really hard to cover. The quarterback can almost always get that yardage when you got it blocked out in front of him, and he, he was there as long as you seal up the inside. So Wheaton picking up a critical first down. Yeah, this offense needs to spend some time on the field, give their defense a chance to catch its breath. First and 10 from the 41, Stone Watson in the backfield. Four-man rush for the Johnnies on a play fake for Luke Anthony. It hitches, goes across the middle, wide open as Nichols, and a sliding catch made at the St. John's 40. Great protection there, and you give Anthony protection, and he is going to move the ball. Erdman, by the way, in the first quarter, 11 of 14, 172 yards and two touchdowns. So as advertised from the All-American, they just ran the ball uh, four times and threw it 14. First and 10 uh, down to the Johnny 41-yard line. Under center goes Anthony with Stone Watson in the backfield, and he will play fake. A lot of time to throw. Anthony now rolling to his right, looking for help, going to throw it down the sideline and away. Stone Watson had broke free late across the middle of the field, but Anthony had time to stand in the pocket and, and took off a little early. Well, the receivers are standing there. they, they got to move. When the quarterback's scrambling, you got to slide back to the middle of the field. you got to break deep. There's, there are rules, scramble rules, receivers should follow, and you'll see there's three of them all standing in the same area. There's and no one to throw to. Anthony had time to sit and wait as well because Watson was breaking open. Second and 10 at the 41. Watson on the left hip of Luke Anthony here. St. John's showing the front four. They will bring five on a delay. It comes up the middle. It's complete to Adam Torini. Torini makes the catch at the 30 and is driven back. We'll see where the spot is, but it looks like enough for a first down, and it is. Nice job there. Again, you had a free blitzer there and just got Anthony gets the ball out of his hands. Great job. Again, the key on this defensive front for the Thunder is identify who's coming. You're going to see guys blitz free, and that's because they got seven interchangeable parts up there on the, between the three down men and the four linebackers, and different four or five are rushing every time, and you just it's really difficult to identify which one. St. John's does a great job disguising it. Trips to the left side here on first and ten as motion comes from Carson Lean. Stops, checks out, back into the trip set. Looking left, play fake for Anthony. Well protected. All day to throw. Now he's going to escape, but right into the hand. Nope, he's out free again. Going to throw down the sidelines and away. Boy, Luke Anthony refusing to go down. He looked like he was dead to rights in the arms of Seth Morum, but fought free and throws it away. Really great job of protection, but a better job of coverage. The Johnnies are doing a great job down the field of not letting guys get open. Anthony doing a good job of not, make, not having a negative play. You don't want to be behind the chain. Second and ten here. Need to get positive yards. It is T.J. Watson in the backfield this time. Jack Miller wing to the right for Wheaton. Second and 10, 31, just shy of three minutes into the second quarter. St. John scoring on their first drive and on their most recent drive. Give is to T.J. Williams. Cuts back with a small crease, steps out of a tackle and gets down to the 25-yard line. Patient run for T.J. And it'll be third and three for the Thunder offense. Yeah, we'll take, Thunder coaches will take six yards on that second down to bring up a third and manageable four yards here. But a big four yards down here in the red zone. We're close, very close to it. You're kind of inside the area where you might think about field goal if you don't get something here, but you also could have a four down territory situation. Two tight end look here. Michael Gale tight right. They're using Burt McJunkin as a tight end to the left side of the line. St. John's showing pressure through the middle, and now they've got another one walked down to the line tight to the left. Play fake for Anthony, time to throw, Dro drops underneath to Michael Gale, who makes the catch and is brought down at the 16. That's just the second catch of the year for Michael Gale. Well, I talked to, to um, Jesse Scott, the offensive coordinator on the field before the game, and he said they really wanted to get these tight ends involved in the passing game. They felt like there was opportunities there, especially off play action. And there you see on a big third down getting that, getting that first down. Sits down between Sias and Caravu, and Sias makes the tackle. First and 10, first trip to the red zone. Here for the Thunder, they started at the St. John's 17. Seeing a lot of communication here between the Wheaton offensive line and the sideline. It looks like Jake Hibben's trying to call the play there. <laughs> first and 10, motion comes from Nichols. They will play fake, throw it into the slot for Nichols. Nichols inside the 15, and he powers down to the 11. Run out of bounds by James Enman, and the tackle also made by Tommy Dieters for the Johnnies. But a five-yard pickup, and most importantly, Wheaton stayed on schedule on this possession. Yeah, they've stayed ahead of the chains and, and done a good job managing it here. Now you just got to finish. Uh, this is an important drive for the Thunder to get seven points and to make this a one-score game. 
Most importantly, they've given their defense some time to rest. Lean back off the field in replacement of Michael Gale. Two tight ends to the right side with McJunkin also there. St. John's pressures up the middle, rolling to the right side. Drop off TJ Williams, five, stumbles into the end zone. Touchdown, Thunder. And that's a huge one for Wheaton. Big drive to answer there after giving up the big long pass from Jackson Erdman to make it a 14-0 game for them to come down and, and score. Just tells you you're in for a ball game. That's a, a, a really a much needed score by the Thunder. Wheaton's missing some guys on the block unit right now. Gale's trying to signal to the side, and this is River Schindeldecker who's coming out to block. It's going to be Schindeldecker's job to stop coming off, someone coming off the edge for the extra point attempt by Griffin Bowes. Out of the hold of John Bickle, Phil Barber, the long snapper, and the operation is clean for the Thunder, and it's down to a 14-7 St. John's lead. Big score of the Thunder in that first quarter. Just had seven plays, two rushes, and five passes for just 15 yards. But there they took the ball from you know, their own side of the field and drove all the way down for a touchdown with a mix of run and pass. Some great runs in there. Tough running by T.J. Williams. And uh, some great play calling to take advantage and make this a one-score game, 14-7. A big drive, a much-needed drive by this Thunder offense. Takes just shy of five minutes on the clock and most importantly finds the end zone. And we'll see what Bose can do into the wind here. Ten twelve left first half, 14-7 lead. The Johnnies have scored on drives of 75 and 94 yards. Wheaton just taking that one down to score to cut this into a one-score lead. I'm Rusty Lindsay along with Doug Rothschild. Thanks for tuning in to WTSN today. Quarterfinal football action between two of the best teams in Division Three. Griffin Bowes to kick this one off, and he pounds this one high end over end, and it will go into the end zone for another touchback. Number 41 on the year for Griffin Bowes. Great job by Griffin Bowes. And the, the Thunder have two really prolific kickers in Bowes. And Bickle as the punter, and Bickle also doubles as the, the um, holder, I believe, on the, on the extra point. So those two guys have done a fantastic job in special teams area for the Thunder. Muhlenberg has added to its lead over Salisbury in the east, 24-0. The Mules leading the Seagulls in that one, 14-0 North Central leading Delaware Valley. Last score we had from Belton was Whitewater 3, Mary Harden Baylor 0. 14-7 here as Jackson Erdman takes over. Play fake and steps back in the pocket, looking to his right, and he throws completed to Ravi Alston, working against Roland, and Roland will drag him down for a first down. And there you see one of the things St. John's is doing on offense is they're, they're blocking with extra guys. You see the tight end stays in, the running back stays in. They're blocking with seven with just this four. If you do that, you're going to have open guys. If you're doing that and playing off man to protect the big play, you're going to get throws like that. So the Thunder have to tighten up their coverage if they want to take that away. There's only a two-man route out there, and you got f seven guys covering. So there's five guys covering nothing and two guys covering those routes. 10-0 to score now. Whitewater over Mary Hart and Baylor. First and 10, and a play fake again for Erdman. McCray breaks loose. They're throwing for the tight end, and it's broken up at the last minute. A flag comes down. Robbie Schwartz is going to get flagged for pass interference. And I think the interesting thing here is going to come from the front side when his coverage was on the back side, and you had two officials there. Pass interference, defense well, number one. It looks like he gets his hand in there, hooking him a little bit down. right before the pass. You can see, now nah, it doesn't look like much. You've nah, got a guy like with much. a better view on the back side that does not throw that flag. Well, they both have a view, and the, the guy on the front side is looking for a hand coming around on the side or, or tugging on an elbow or something like that. He must have seen something. But on the replay, it was hard to see anything. Tough call. So St. John's catches a break, and the ball goes across midfield to the 49. Four wide receivers. Hodge inside of Patrick left for Jackson Erdman. And he will look to the right side. Quick hitter, and Wyatt Lees blows it up in the backfield. Shot out of a cannon to that quick hitter to Matt Moore, and Wyatt Lee knocks him down. They're only going to give him a loss of one on the play. Great read there by Wyatt Lee. Just a bad decision by Erdman. I don't know what the other option is, but there's three guys out there on defense and one guy blocking. So somebody's coming free, and it was Wyatt Lee. Does a good job making a tackle for a loss. Kempner, the tight end, checks in. 
And we'll see where they line up. The 6'3", 235, 230-pound senior. He's going to be split to the right, working against Robbie Schwartz again. So clearly that's a matchup they want to get, the big man against Robbie Schwartz. First down, looking to the right to throw out, out of the flat to Barber, and he makes the catch and knocked down out of bounds by Schwartz, and a big third down coming up, third and five for St. John's. Yeah, picked up six there, just a little flat curl combination. Wide receiver runs a little or slant flat combination, just something simple against the blitz. Nice job of protection. The Johnnies have done a good job protecting Erdman early and giving him time, and if you do, uh, he is going to thrive. So big third down here. They need the 39. Wins right and left for Erdman. Wheaton does not show pressure, but St. John's is going to call timeout anyhow. First charge timeout, St. John's. Yeah, big big play in the game here on the on the Wheaton side of the 50. You want to make sure you get the right play in. Uh, super important for St. John's to try to answer that score and move the sticks. Big play for the Thunder defense to try to get a stop and get the ball back. You don't know. I mean, this might be four down territory for St. John's. They might be talking about that. Maybe they do some sort of running play here, thinking that if they don't get it, they're going to go for it on fourth anyway on that side of the, on that side of the field in this area. Um, you just have to be, you have to play your rules and play smart defense. Still looking for the first incompletion for Brock Rudder over in Naperville as the Cardinals lead DelVal 14 to nothing. This is two weeks in a row. North Central has gone against the number two defense in the country as far as yards allowed per game after they blew Mount Union out of that spot. And so a big one coming up here on third and five. We'll see what C.J. Nightingale dials up. Last time he brought pressure, St. John's had it timed up well, and they ran that tunnel screen to the outside. Again, not a lot of running plays so far for St. John's. It's been all Erdman in the passing game. Five runs, five yards for the Johnnies, six runs, 19 yards for the Thunder. So it, it wouldn't surprise me if they try to run here thinking about four downs. Wheaton brings pressure. Erdman's looking to his left, and that is complete to Patrick. Has a first down, cuts back to the inside, takes a hit, and goes down at the 32-yard line. And the way the Thunder play, that's going to be there. You know, they're, they're playing an off-man look, trying to get home with four. Erdman again getting the ball out of his hands. You see him, he is not, he's got a clock going inside of his head. He knows when he's got to get rid of the ball. He's doing a good job. Working around Gamicha there to get a couple extra yards down to the 32, five wide. Looking to his right, has Hodge underneath. Schwartz is all over him. Schwartz playing a heck of a game in coverage early, holds that to a five yard gain. TJ Hodge making his second catch of the game. Now two catches, seven yards as Erdman thrown for 200 yards now, 15 of 18 on the day. Now these are the situations where St. John's likes to take shots into the end zone. They got second and five. They know they probably got two downs left to get the first after this, third and fourth. So this is the type of situation where they do that. They bring in uh, 84 as a tight end who's more of a pass catcher, Jack Kempner. He's split out on the slot on the left side. Trips to the right side, split left. Wheaton kind of got guys all over the place and they finally have to use a timeout. Spencer Rowland was back playing safety. First charge timeout. Just didn't line up Wheaton. right. I think Robbie Schwartz put his head down and ran to the left side. Didn't realize the tight end came back to the right side. Well, and Robbie's uh, hearing is not great, so it's hard for him to hear calls when they change them afterwards. One of the reasons he lines up to the Wheaton sideline so that he can get communication a little better. And there, it looks like they just couldn't get the right call and the guys matched up right. So smart to take the timeout. But again, you'd rather take the timeout and be lined up correctly than give up a big play. Oh, no no doubt. I mean, Erdman's out there, and that look, he is looking for the matchup he wants. He knows exactly where he's going to throw the ball pre-snap, and based on their film work and the matchups that, they, that they've seen on film, they know exactly what they're looking for. It'd be interesting to see if they come out in the same set to run uh, a similar play. So the Johnnies huddle 7-14. We're just past the midway spot of the second quarter. Different personnel in the game now, so this is a different play. Trips, trips, in, trips left and isolated right is Robbie Alston, and now they'll send Barber out to the boundary, and Ryan Schwartz will run with him. Pressure comes against him. He's going to throw deep. Roland tripped, and Alston falls down and makes the catch in the end zone. Robbie Alston, his second touchdown catch of the game, as Roland tripped in coverage and couldn't catch up. And again, that's a situation where 
as I mentioned, on second and five, down in that 30-yard line area, you know you've got, you're going to go four downs probably, so you're going to take a shot there, and that's exactly what this St. John's offense is known for, and they've done it here, putting up 21 points, which is, well, if they make the extra point, it'll be the most points the Thunder have given up all season, and we still have seven minutes to go in the second quarter. Colin Coomer on for the extra point. Good snap, good hold, and the extra point is low, but it is good. This has been a kicking unit that's been susceptible to having guys get, having guys block kicks off the edge, as we'll see again here on the replay. Good protection against a five-man rush, and then rolling, tripping around the 10-yard line. As a ball that only Alston's going to catch, he throws it perfectly outside, and then he makes a well, great they, adjustment in the air. And great job by the St. John's coaches, because by moving the running back out wide, they see Schwartz goes out, so Erdman knows it's man coverage. Because the linebacker doesn't go out if it's a zone coverage. He only goes out if it's man. He's got that running back man, so he splits out. Ryan Schwartz leaves the middle of the field. Erdman knows he's got single coverage on his slot receiver. He's running that corner route, and, and unfortunately for the Thunder, their best cover guy, Roland, stumbles a little bit. And um, Hodge makes a great catch, actually falling down. And Erdman puts it where only his guy could catch it. So great identification in terms of using formation to, to give the quarterback the knowledge of where he's going to go. And if he had split out and the Thunder had stayed in a zone, he would have known where to go then too. So the, the, the coach, that's what the timeout was used for is to determine, hey, this is what you're looking for. Solar is to do the kickoff, and this will be end over end, bringing Magnuson all the way up near the 20-yard line. Going to angle back towards the middle of the field. It's well covered. He makes a cut, though, gets the seam to the 35. And then somersaults out across the 35 to the 36, maybe the, even the 37. Kick coverage has been a problem for St. John's. Chapman had several big returns last week. That's one where they've got Nate Magnuson pretty well stopped, and he just makes enough of a cut to get some, about 10 extra yards. So now it'll come down to Luke Anthony and company, and a big drive here. Important for Wheaton to not only find the end zone, but not give St. John's enough time that they could add a score. Wheaton's got a chance with the halftime swing and getting the ball first in the second half. Yeah, big drive here for the Thunder again. They, they've got to answer. Fake pitch sweep again. Time in the pocket for Anthony, and that time runs out. But again, he escapes the pocket, and he's able to get a yard on the scramble. He's been dead to rights about three times in the backfield and has fought every time to get out of it. That time he gains a yard on first down. Really would like to see the Thunder try to establish a little bit more of a running game here. I think they have the ability to do it against this front. It's tough, but they, they need to be committed to it. They don't want to get into a passing contest between these two quarterbacks. Second and nine as Nichols slides down. Give us to T.J. Williams. T.J. trying to find a hole and does to the 40. Short gain there and brought down by Nick Jensen. Jensen rotates in a lot at defensive end. This is a, a deep defensive line. And a big third and six now for the Thunder offense, already trailing by two scores. Yeah, big third down here. Got to pick this one up if you're the Thunder. Just under six minutes to go in the half. Nichols motions into a trip left. Caleb Brink is isolated right. Corner blitz coming. They will back off, four-man rush. Throwing across the middle, completed to Brink against Tommy Dieters, and that's a big one to the underused Caleb Brink, just his 13th catch of the year, but it moves the chains across midfield. Nice job by the Thunder, recognizing the coverage. Luke Anthony sees he's got man coverage, throws a slant. Brink uses his body, gets across the face of the corner. Brink's a big target, 6'5", 207 pounds. Yeah, on a slant, your job is to cross the face of the DB, and the quarterback's supposed to throw it to the spot in front. First down, they will give to Stone Watson, who is knocked down at the line of scrimmage by Richard Caravu. Again, the, the St. John's likes to do some sort of run blitz on first down after you get a first down, and that's what that was. You had the linebacker, Caravu, who's an all Mayak player, uh, blitzing from the weak side, and he's not a player you account for in a running game with that play coming off the right side, and he's able to break through and get a tackle at the line of scrimmage. Also a little bit of a slow developing run there for Stone Watson. No gain, keeps the ball at the 46-yard line inside of five minutes left in the first half. Watson stays in the game in the backfield on the left hip of Luke Anthony, takes the handoff, has a seam, explodes across the 40, and he's going to be just shy of a first down. It'll be third and less than a yard, it appears. 
Nice kick out block by McGill to open that up and then Watson powering through arm tackles to get to the line to gain. So Watson and Williams gonna be in the game now. And this is a situation that Swider Here may comes indeed. Paulina. Yeah, Swider may indeed be thinking two down territory himself inside the other opponent's 40, a little bit too long for a field goal. He might be thinking we're gonna take two pops at this. Loaded backfield with Hibben the fullback. They will give Stone Watson and he tripped. Was gonna have enough to get to the yard to gain and he tripped. And they lose two. Yeah, now he's probably got to punt it. Sure enough. Again, execution, that's that's a situation where you gotta stay up. That's exactly what you're looking for. St. John's is gonna keep their defense on the field here. Oh, of course, yeah. And th this situation you always would. Um, th you're not gonna get a return anyway, just be pretty much a fair catch, which they'll put, hot, put Hodge back there to uh, put his heels right around there. Well, it looks like he's gonna stand at the five and uh, fair catch anything that comes in there. So they're just gonna try to pin him. Yeah, third and short, Wheaton has really struggled today. Had a couple of chances and it's a fake and Beamer dropped the football. It's loose, still loose at midfield. Wow. Felt like an area of the field. Prior where to the play, a... delay game, offense. Wow. Five yard penalty, wow. fourth down. Wow. A huge break on a mistake for Wheaton. They took too long to snap the ball, so they're going to get a second chance. Game clock operator, can you please put 3 1 0 on the clock? 3 10, please. <laughs> well, that's a huge break for the Thunder there because that was nothing short of a debacle. I don't know if Beamer was going to run it. Most likely he was going to look to throw it. He's the, he is the backup quarterback, which the Thunder have used. The backup quarterback is the personal protector on punt all season. And when Spencer Peterson went down, uh, Beamer was the guy up there. And again, that's that's a no-play situation. It looked like St. John's got across the line early that time as Bickle knocks this one back to the three. Hodge is going to make a return, and he's going to be brought down from behind at the 13-yard line. Looked a little bit, without, without having to see it again, that St. John's had jumped on the far side of the line, almost given that five yards back. Caleb Grotolution making that tackle from behind there. So 3-0-1, two timeouts, and... You know, 70, that, 70 yards that ahead. fake punt, it looked, like, it looked like Beamer wasn't expecting to get the snap. Like he didn't have the call. Well, he came out of the field late, too, so maybe there was a call on that he wasn't in the huddle for. And a lot of times those fakes have two calls. If they give you the look you want, you're going to run the fake, and if they don't, then you're going to just punt it. Erdman back to pass, comes back to the right side. It's completed for a first down to the 25, give him the 26. That is Matt Moore, who's been very active today. That's already his fifth catch. Ties Robbie Alston for the team lead. And look, the story of this first half has got to be the play of the offensive line of this St. John's unit. They've held this defensive front that's been prolific all year to not much production. They got a little bit early, but the last few drives, they really haven't gotten anywhere near Erdman. First and 10 up to the 26. Clock rolls, two and a half minutes left. Wheaton gets the ball to start the second half, so this would be a big stop if Wheaton can find a way to get off the field. Trips to the left side, Erdman off his back foot and Moore makes a diving catch into the sideline at the 33 yard line. The Thunder just running some stunts there. Try to get some, uh, some kind of pressure. And Jake Holiday comes off the left side and is able to get home. Clock runs again. 2-10 and counting. Again, two timeouts and St. John's has shown plenty of ability to move the ball at will today. Already over 250 yards past. Wheaton bringing pressure. They're going to go up the rail, working against Schwartz, and it's into the Wheaton sideline. Schwartz running stride for stride with Blake Patrick, who just beat him on the second touchdown. Yeah, and this is, again, a second and three or less. This is an automatic for Erdman. He's going to look at the matchup he wants and try to throw the ball down the field thinking he's got another down to pick up the first down. So big third down here for the Thunder. If they can get a stop and get the ball back, they got a chance, despite the miscues they've done in the late in this in this second quarter, they got a chance to do something here if they can get a stop right here. But right. that's also a tall task given the game so far. This play especially would be a big stop. Trips to the left side for Erdman. They're going to run speed option, pitch out to Trost, and he's going to, it's going to depend on the spot. Pretty generous spot's right going to give him the first yep. down. See it again on the replay. He needed the 36-yard line. 
It's a nice play made by Schwartz. The knee's down at the it. 35, but the ball's extended ball's, to yeah. the 36. Yep, that was a good spot. Actually, probably a little bit bad for St. John's. They probably got another half yard out of that. First and, excuse me, minute 40 left. First and 10 to the 36. Comes back to the right side and airmails Ravi Alston over there. Had Alston in the flat against Gamicha. And it'll be second and 10 for the Johnnies with a minute 35 left here first half. Two timeouts remaining for both teams. Big series right here. You got a minute 35, second down. Big couple of plays here. If the Thunder can figure out a way to get a stop, get the ball back, and do something with it. Now they'll get the ball to start the second half. That's what they're thinking here, but again, they got to play defense right now. Big time uh, setup. Two straight incompletions after 13 straight completions for Erdman, and he's going to be wrapped up and he gets out of the tackle twice, and now he's brought down from behind by Dallas McCray. Both of these quarterbacks have been incredibly elusive in the pocket, and timeout St. John's with a minute, and well, the clock's still running. Should be about a minute 22 when it's all when the, it's all said and done. And Schindeldecker a little shaken up after that. Play. Second charge timeout, St. John's. Game clock operator, please put 125 on the clock. 125, please. 125 seems a little generous, but they will put seven on. Quick check around the country in other games. Muhlenberg, 24-0 over Salisbury in the fourth quarter. North Central, 14-0 over Delaware Valley, and they've got the ball uh, at the Delaware Valley five-yard line with 30 seconds left in the first half. And down in Belton, Texas, it's Whitewater 10, Mary Harden Baylor 7 with 30 seconds left in the first half. So huge third down here, third and 10, 125 to go. The Thunder have two timeouts. The Johnnies have just one. Uh, John, St. John's going to be pretty aggressive here to pick up this first down. They would love to go down and get some more points to pad this lead. The Thunder, of course, would love to get a stop, be able to come back and get some kind of points before the half because they get the ball coming out the second half. So big part of the game right here, uh, big plays. Third and 10 from the 36, and a huge one, and they motion into a quad set to the right side with Trost inside. Split left, three-man pressure. Pressure comes from McCray, and down he goes! Back at the 25-yard line. And Wheaton's going to take a timeout with a minute 17 left. But Dallas McCray gets the first sack of the game for either squad. And it's a big one because it drops him all the way back to the 26-yard line. Well, that's what the Thunder needed right here. Now their offense Second has got to show timeout. up. They got Wheaton. a special teams play game right here. Operator. Please put 1-2-0 on the clock, 120. So they'll put time back on yet again. So Wheaton's going to have one timeout. And 80 seconds leading into this punt. We'll see if they brought pressure effectively the first time. I would think they try to play this one for a return. Yeah, if you get, if you catch the ball and get, you know, five to ten yards on the return, you're going to have really good field position with a timeout left. That's what I would probably do. So pressure comes on Cole Mills to get off a good one. Low snap. Mills picks it up. It's a good spiraling kick away. Tucker rushing over. Let's no. it bounce. That's the cardinal sin. He let it bounce, and it's going to roll all the way down to the maybe even the 10-yard wow. line. That's a huge mistake by the freshman, Matthew Tucker. Yeah, and I would have liked to see Nichols back on that because you need to have your senior guys in, the, in these moments. That's such a key play in the game, and you see him as he runs if they show the replay. You see as he runs, he's looking at the rush and trying to look at the ball. Don't look at the rush or the ball. Signal fair catch and sprint to the ball and catch it. That is the number one job of a punt returner is not to get a return. It's to catch the ball in the air because this is the type. Those are huge yards, probably 25 yards a roll you get on that and pins the, the thunder deep, and that's just going to make them be a little bit conservative, I'm sure, down here. St. John's had too many men on the field. Alex Sayas getting off at the last minute. First down, play fake for Anthony. Time in the pocket. Now he's going to step up and run out across the 10 to the 15, sliding down at the 14-yard line. And now I think they're probably going to be content to take just to take this to halftime. It's a massive mistake from Tucker because it changes the attitude that Wheaton has to this possession. Yeah. And sure enough, there's no urgency here. They're just going to take this thing to the half. Maybe take one more shot and see if they can get something. But Lean coming on for McJunkin tells you that there's not looking to push the ball. I'd be surprised if they didn't hand the ball off here. They do, and it's T.J. Williams, and Williams now with a seam to the near side, 20, and gets out of bounds shy of the 25. 
So they'll at least get a first down, 26 seconds on the clock. So again, until, until you really get the ball to midfield, not going to be a whole lot of urgency for the Thunder with one timeout. And again, the line for Bose is probably the 35-yard line to really give him a chance to try a field goal. Hey, you got two tight ends here, going to probably run the ball again. McJunkin, I see Miller motioning left. Five-step drop, Anthony going to take off and run. Anthony across the 30, sliding down. And that'll probably be the end of the first half. Clock still running there, at least looking to the sideline, but knowing Coach Swider, they're just going to take this to the half, and they will. So Wheaton with a frustrating first half. As it's the end of the first half. Just poor execution there in the second quarter, and St. John's with their offense firing at all cylinders, they're going to take a 21-7 lead into the halftime break. Yeah, I mean, it's really a, the Saint, classic St. John's football in the first half. A lot of Erdman and some good defense, and uh, they've done a fan fantastic job executing their game plan. The Thunder are going to get the ball to start the half, and uh, they're going to need to come out and get a drive and get a stop to get back in this game. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of this game. This game is going to really hinge on how the Thunder do in the opening minutes of that second half. So that's what we'll be looking for. We'll step aside here at the halftime break. We'll come back, look ahead to the second half, give you the first half statistics. St. John's leading 21-7 here at McCauley Stadium. You're watching quarterfinal playoff football from the Wheaton Thunder Sports Network. good grades and to do well but it also made me realize that I have a lot of career goals. You're there to get a full college experience not only participate in your sport but participate in things outside of that and it's all about growing as a person. My coaches have helped me with figuring out who I really am. Their lives are dedicated for us to succeed.
being a part of the different activities and organizations that I've been a part of, I'm actually able to see myself where I'm like, hey, I actually can make a change. I'm one person that can make a difference. Division three has helped me to develop teamwork skills, critical thinking skills, time management skills. It's not just about basketball or it's not just about school, it's about developing yourself as a person altogether. College has given me the flexibility to pursue my passions and my interests, and I've recreated my identity for myself aside from just being an athlete. My greatest personal discovery has been that I am capable of doing things that I didn't know I was capable of doing. To be able to study what I wanted to and continue to play the sport I love, all of those things came together very nicely in one package in Division Three. One word I'd use to describe my Wheaton experience is purposeful. And I say purposeful because through people and experiences here, the Lord has been teaching me to reorient my desires and aspirations for work in His kingdom. Flourishing. I chose the word flourishing because of the specific leadership and mentorship opportunities I've experienced at Wheaton and how they've allowed me not only to grow here, but given me the confidence to navigate life after Wheaton. Winning. I chose the word winning because I feel like all my friends and professors have encouraged me to have a winning mindset. Full. I chose the word full because my Wheaton College experience has been full of mentorship and friendship here and I've been left with intergenerational friendship that I'm going to take with me for the rest of my life. Transformative. The reason why I chose the word transformative is because of all the ways I've been influenced by my professors, my peers, and my friends at my time at Wheaton. Rooted. The reason I chose the word rooted is because I am leaving Wheaton grounded in both my faith and calling. Unexpected. The reason I chose this word is because I expected to be challenged by Wheaton's academics, but I wasn't expecting how I would be challenged and grown through Wheaton's athletics, student life, and student engagement. Deep. I chose the word deep because of the deep relationships I've been able to build with friends and all the people I've been able to meet at Wheaton. Holistic. 
I chose that word because Wheaton has taken my education and my vision for my life and it's expanded it and shaped it physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually in every way. Journey. The reason why I chose Journey is because of the many highs and lows that I've experienced here at Wheaton. These highs and lows are a taste of what life after Wheaton is going to be like. And this is why I love Wheaton. Welcome back here to McCulley Stadium along with Doug Rothschild. I'm Rusty Lindsay. Thanks for tuning in here. Quarterfinal action. Wheaton trailing St. John's 21-7 at the halftime break. St. John's was able to get what they wanted offensively. Wheaton's offense has struggled to execute in key moments, specifically a couple of third and shorts, and that's really been the difference in this game. Doug, you've got the stat sheet. Take us through the first half numbers. So for the Thunder, they ran 27 plays in the first half. They gained 132 total yards. Luke Anthony in the passing game was 9 of 13 for 81 yards and one touchdown. In the rushing game, they ran the ball 14 times for 51 yards. T.J. Williams, 6 carries for 25 net yards. Luke Anthony scrambled for 4 times and gained 14 yards. Stone Watson had 4, car four carries for 12 yards. And receiving Phillip Nichols. Adam Torini and T.J. Williams all with two catches. Nichols two for 24, Torini two for 16, T.J. two for 12, and Caleb Brink had the one for the first down on the slant pass. On the defensive side, Ryan Schwartz, the leading tackler with nine. Caden Sigler has five. Wyatt Lee with four. Dallas McCray with three, including the one sack and two tackles for loss. Wyatt Lee adding also two of his as tackles for loss. The Thunder's time of possession was 13 minutes and 23 seconds. They were penalized just three times for 30 yards. St. John's on the flip side, 32 plays, so five more than the Thunder. 
250 total yards. Jackson Erdman, the story, 19 of 24, no interceptions, 252 yards, three touchdowns, along of 969. He was sacked once. The rushing game, not much to speak of. Eight rushes for just for minus two yards, actually, for St. John's. Henry Trost, three carries for five yards. Kai Barber, two for two yards. Jackson Erdman, three for minus nine. You should note that the sack goes as a negative rushing yards, which is why the sack total is a negative number. On the receiving side, Matt Moore had six catches for 40 yards. Robbie Alston, 5 for 94. Kai Barber, 3 for 13. And Blake Patrick, 2 for 81, including the 69-yard touchdown. Those two catches brought him from nine catches on the season to up to 11. On the defensive end, James Inman, three hits. Ryan Lacoste, three. Petrzewski, two. And Kohler, two. Time of possession, despite the Thunder running the ball 14 times and being very balanced, 14 uh, 14 runs, 13 passes. They lost the time of possession battle, 16 to 13. The St. John's offense or the St. John's team was not penalized in the first half. So just three total penalties in the game, all three on Whedon. Red, red zone scoring chances. Each team scored once in the red zone. Two of uh, St. John's touchdowns came on long plays out of the red zone. Whedon's a team that has had just four penalties called on its opponents now through five halves of playoff football. So we've got three and a half minutes left here before we start the second half. St. John's just coming out of the locker room down to our left. Wheaton, majority of their team still in the meeting room down. They'll come out down to our right. But Wheaton's going to take the, uh, the opening kickoff and score here. I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to. Wheaton's got to find a way to get this back to a one-score game and give their defense a chance to make a play. Well, even more basic than that, you had a first half where St. John's controlled the line of scrimmage on both sides, and the Thunder came in, you know, with a front four that had been very disruptive, and you know they did a little bit of damage, but not the damage that they expected, and they're and they're sitting back, trying to uh, cover with seven and rush with four, and they're not getting home, and so Erdman has had a lot of time to throw the ball. He's done a good job managing the clock, uh, managing the offense and having a high completion percentage, which you'd expect him coming in. But the Thunder have got to figure out a way to put pressure on Erdman and tighten up the coverage uh, as well. So, um, you know, St. John's has controlled the line of scrimmage on offense. They're, they're All-American uh, at left tackle, and they also have an All-American at right guard. The left tackle's Ben Barch. We've talked about the right guard. Greenhack is a three-time first-team All-MIAC and two-time D3 football All-American. Those guys have been handling the line of scrimmage, done a good job. They haven't had any running game, but they haven't tried much of a running game either. They've been putting the ball in Erdman's hands, which they should. And on the flip side, the Thunder have moved the Test. ball enough, but uh, on a couple of two different third down and ones, they weren't able to pick up the first down. And um, St. John's largely has done a good job making Luke Anthony scramble. Good job on the back end in coverage. And good job up front kind of limiting the rushing game. They've given the Thunder do have 51 yards rushing. They need to stay committed to the rushing game. But the biggest thing is they need to stay on the field on third down and convert those if they're going to stay in this game. So they're going to get the ball. This first drive is really huge. You know, you'd love to see, a, if you're a Thunder fan, you'd love to see a score off the first drive and then a stop on the first Johnny's drive. Thunder have been great at first half. At second half adjustments all season long. On the flip side, if you're St. John's, you'd love to get a stop and then take it down and 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 make this a three score game. So that whatever happens in that whole outcome is going to really go a long way to determine what's going to happen in this game. Getting pretty close to putting our first final on the board. Muhlenberg with the ball under three minutes down inside the Salisbury five yard line, and uh, the Mules look like they're about to knock off Salisbury. And Muhlenberg would host the winner of St. John's Del Val next week for in a semi, I assume. Correct. I believe that's either either way. And Muhlenberg's taking a knee, so I think that without being able to see where the clock is in that game, I think it works out well enough that they can run it out. So the Mules are going to go on the board first, a 24-8 winner over Salisbury. And Muhlenberg will await the winner of North Central and Delaware Valley. North Central leading 17 to nothing at halftime in Naperville. 
Another key play right here, actually just the kick return. St. John's has given up some big kick returns in, during this season. That's, the special teams has been an area of struggle, and the Thunder have been, been pretty good. They're one of the top teams in the country at kickoff return. So if they can get a good return, big return here, set up their offense, that would go a long way to getting themselves back in this game. Magnuson and Tucker back. Solers to kick it away for St. John's. As we're underway to start the second half. This will be Matthew Tucker, best kickoff of the day for Solars. It drops him all the way back to the 5, and Tucker's going to bring it out across the 25, and a big hit there. Tackle made by number 49, Eric Bjork, the freshman out of Mata Media, Minnesota, and that'll be Wheaton's starting point for a big drive as we start the second half. Elsewhere, Mary Harden Baylor trailing Whitewater 10-7. Down in Belton, if Mary Hart and Baylor wins, they would host the winner of this game. If Whitewater wins, the winner of this game would be the likely home game for a semifinal game next week. First and 10 at their own 28 for Luke Anthony, who will throw it into the flat for Phil Nichols, makes the catch. Nichols at the 30, and Nichols will be wrestled down by the combination of Dieters and Lacasse for a gain of four. But Nichols had a quiet first half, so nice to see Jesse get, get him the ball to start the second. Yeah, but just a high percentage play, easy throw. You got a guy who can beat people in space. Good job tackling there, but four yards on first down, we'll take it. It's a nice job by Dieters to keep him away from the sideline and bring him back to traffic. Ball at the 32 as Anthony off a play fake into the flat for Jack Miller. The tight end makes the catch, and a nice tackle made again by Lacoste there on the other sideline, not letting Miller power through to get a first down. They'll be about a yard and a half shy of the yard to gain. Yeah, that's a big deal there. I mean, you really want to try to pick up that first down. Miller's a 6'4", 227-pound guy, and Lacoste comes up at 6'1", 210. So he does a good job stoning him. Uh, usually that, that bigger tight end is going to fall forward and get that first down. Good tackle there by the St. John safety. Third and two from the 36. So Wheaton in a, in a play they need to pick up. Safeties are walked down for the Johnnies. Quick hitter to the outside for Torini. Caught and shoved out of bounds by Chris Harris. And a nice job by Jesse Scott, giving Luke Anthony some high percentage throws right out of the gates to build some rhythm for this offense. Yeah, you got to look at how they're covering across the board, and Torini had a little bit of a cushion there. They were bringing a, uh, bringing a safety there. Lacoste was blitzing off the strong side. Did a good job just area blocking it, cutting everybody down and getting that ball out. T.J. Williams, the lone back, and now Miller. Excuse me, that's Caleb Brink, I think. No, that is Miller. Motions back into the backfield. Gives straight ahead to T.J. Williams, and he's going to be Wrapped up before he can get to the line by James Inman. He falls forward for a yard. But again, these running plays are taking a little bit too long to get into the line. Well, and it's not necessarily that as much as you see St. John's a staple of their defense. You get a first down, they're going to blitz a guy off the edge. They're going to blitz an extra guy and a run blitz for that next first down to try to create a negative play. They did that there. Inman is usually a coverage outside linebacker. There he blitzed off the end. He's an unblocked player, and uh, you're going to have that on that play. Burt McJunk in Z-Motion back to the wing left. And they will give to T.J. Williams on a counter, and St. John's is all over it. Back to the original line of scrimmage, maybe farther. And it's again Nick Jensen who's been very disruptive in this game for the Johnnies. Yeah, I think you got to be careful against this front running pulling schemes because they bring so many different guys. It's just hard to identify them. You have to run zone running schemes. You have to run area where guys are just taking their steps and blocking whoever comes across their face, and then let TJ find his spots. Big third down and long here. Third and 11. The Johnnies crowding the line of scrimmage with a lot of bodies. Single high safety. They will end up bringing four. Anthony steps up out of pressure. Still time in the pocket. Delivers, and that's incomplete for Tucker, and no flag. Tucker was mugged at the 43-yard line. I thought it was a good defensive play myself. I mean, it's bang, bang, but I, I didn't we'll watch the replay. I didn't see anything that was callable there. I mean, it's aggressive defense. Anthony's trying to push this ball a little bit. Yeah, it I, looks like, I mean, we got called for a very similar play in the first half that I didn't think it was, should have been a call. And I didn't think that should have been a call either. So. And again, it's Lacoste in coverage. Great job by Lacoste. Made a couple plays on this. He stoned the tight end on second down to set up the third down. Um, they, they did a good job. Bickle now's, booms this that's one. That's going to be a penalty. We're going to get a first down. They just ran into the punter. And Bickle rolls it out of bounds at the three, as he always does. It just depends if they're going to a five or a 15. It looked like a 15-yarder because he, he hit him pretty hard. Yeah. 
This will be just the fifth penalty called against Wheaton's opponent in the postseason. Wheaton's offense is getting set to come back on the field. Personal Rebel foul. foul. Free Ruffing first kicker. Down. Defense. 15 yard penalty. Automatic first down. Really bad mistake by the defense there. He did run into him. That's a good call. I mean, he, he didn't just hit him in the toe. He hit him in the hip. <laughs> The punter, so that that's a fair penalty and huge mistake after a big stop by the St. John's defense. First big mistake they've made today, and a big opportunity for the Thunder now as they're on the St. John's side of the field. Bickle, to his credit, it was a perfect punt, rolled out of bounds just shy of the pylon. So it's first and ten at the St. John's 44. Again, showing pressure are the Johnnies. They bring it. Anthony back to pass. Pitches it out to Stone Watson. Watson picks up a block and stretches it forward to the 41-yard line. St. John's is saying he fumbled the ball. No, They're saying it came loose when he reached forward. Yeah, it did. Running on the field. The That's runner was right. down. Four progress to stop. He reached, down. he reached the ball, which is a dangerous thing to do. Running backs should not really do that. But you see him here. He reaches the yeah, ball. That's a good call. And when it hits, it fumbled. The ref referee sounding like he had no time for any other explanation in his own a lot with of people, the microphone there. A lot of people like to get on their officials. These officials have done a nice job so far. They've done a nice job. Um, they've gotten some, many of these calls right. Second and seven from the 41 of the Johnnies. As Anthony sends two wide receivers to the left side. Play fake off of Williams. Quick hit Torini. Torini with one man to beat, and Dieters makes the tackle at the 25-yard line. Yeah, they're, they're single covering on both, really out wide on both sides of the ball. The Thunder are going to have opportunities to beat guys in man coverage, so they're going to have to look to that a little bit more because they're stacking the line. St. John's loves to stop the run. they got seven, eight guys up in the box here, and so you got to throw the ball when that's the situation. Yeah, that was John Kohler, the safety, who has walked down too far and opened up that window for Torini, who continues to creep towards 1,000 yards receiving. He's about 50 yards shy at this point. First and 10 from the Johnny 27. Play fake for Anthony. Time to pass, now rolling back to his right. Still time, and he's going to tuck it. Now he throws it to Torini, makes the catch, stays in bounds to the 10, spinning inside the 10, all the way down. Hey, he fumbled it. The, the St. John's is saying they have the football. We have not seen a ruling. His forward progress was stopped. We haven't seen a call yet. St. John's is holding the football. It's a question of if forward progress was stopped. And it's going to be St. John's football. Yeah. Huge play in the game right there. Again, anytime you're fighting for yards like that, the defense. Rolling on players. the field, this ball was fumbled, recovered by the defense. First down, St. John's. Here you see the replay. It's a nice play by Anthony and Nick and Torini. Right here. Now, at this point, you just got to get out of bounds. Keep the ball. Tuck it. Now they're pulling at it. They're definitely pulling at it. And there it it's is. It's out. Yeah, that's a fumble. Falls right into the hands of Caribou. So a huge, huge mistake there as Wheaton fumbles at the nine-yard line. And now Erdman can hopefully try to drive a nail for the Johnnies. Quick hitter, complete to Moore, and shoved out of bounds at the 22. Yeah, those are just plays that hitches. The, the Thunder are going to give that up all day, and, and that's just bread and butter for St. John's. They're going to take that. Again, Erdman's done a great job today just taking what the defense has given him. You've seen in games where he doesn't take those and he tries to push the ball down the field. He's not doing that today, and he's, he's having a lot of production. McCray going to force him up in the pocket, dropped underneath the Barber, and Barber going to be brought down to the 31-yard line. Again, another check down throw to his running back, safe throw. Just take him what to get, get you and go to the next play. Nice job there by uh, McCray, who beats Greenheck there and gets in the backfield and forces him up in the pocket, but then he just dumps the ball. A couple of scores elsewhere in other games going on. Delval has scored over in Naperville, so a 17-7 North Central lead. Whitewater has added on to its lead in Texas, 17-7. The Warhawks over Mary Harden Baylor. Second and five from the 27 for the Johnnies. Wyatt Lee is showing pressure. Play fake, flag down, and I think he got a flinch. I think Lee induced movement on the Johnnies. Well, if the, if the defensive player is in the neutral zone when that happens, and they're going to call it on the defense, we'll see what the refs, um, they're well, gathering to talk about that. Lee never did cross the line of scrimmage. He pushed the tackle down. Yeah, they're going to call the offsides. Offsides. Wow. Defense number 92. Five-yard penalty, second down. Going to call it on Holiday. 
Holiday got pushed down by Lee. I never saw him move forward. But it's a first down for Correction, the Johnny. Correction, all the play is a first down. So miscues by the Thunder. The story here, they had an opportunity to make this a one-score game, and now St. John's with the ball to, for their opening drive of the second half, driving. Twins to the right for Erdman on a new set of downs. Play fake. McCray coming from behind. Down he goes again. Dallas McCray with his second sack of the game. And these are the guys that have to get it done for the Thunder. You've got to see McCray show up. You've got to see Pat O'Connell check in at some point here. Yeah, he just he ran right around the uh, Carl Rude. And it's second and 15 for the Johnnies. As they take their time to huddle, time is on their side, leading by two scores. Wheaton going down to maybe cut this to a one-score game when Torini was held up and stripped at the nine-yard line. Four-man rush again for Erdman, and Schindeldecker grabs him. Ball's up in the air, and it's going to fall to the turf. Yeah, and that's the, those are the things that Erdman can do under pressure. You saw that's the type of stuff that gives St. John's fans the chills when Erdman under pressure just tries to dump it. He threw probably three interceptions of his four were in this type of situation where he's just trying to get rid of it and uh, end up in interceptions. Lucky there for the for the Johnnies. Uh, no harm, no foul. Third down and long here. Big play here for the Thunder to be able to get off the field. Wheaton has to get off the field here on third and 15. But they've got to Erdman each of the last two times. McCray and then Schindeldecker. Staying with a four-man front here instead of going nickel. And they will stay in and protect. Draw. Give on the draw to Trost. He trips up, and he goes down well short of the line. Wyatt Lee and Ryan Schwartz were all over it. There was nowhere to run, but the Wheaton defense comes up with a huge stop. Pretty conservative call there, and we got Nichols back returning the punt. No as, surprise. Yeah, as he should have been. That was a massive mistake by the freshman Tucker letting that punt roll at the end of the first half. Same situation here. Number one thing is go catch the ball in the air. Almost, like you said, like almost the exact situation as what we had at the end of the first half. A little bit of a different punt formation here for St. John's. Low snap, Mills picks it up. High kick, Nichols calls for the fair catch and makes it at the 43-yard line. Almost exactly the spot it would have been caught on that drive earlier. So great job by Nichols, sets up this Wheaton offense despite the fumble in the red zone. They, st they get a stop from the pressure that McCray puts on, gets the sack of Erdman, puts them in long yardage, and they stay, uh, they stay clean on third down. And now their offense has good field position. They got to go down and do something here. So TJ Williams, the lone back, as Anthony goes under center. McJunkin and Miller are going to switch here. Plenty of time on the play clock as now Miller motions into the backfield. First and 10 from the 43. They will give straight ahead to TJ Williams, and Williams runs into a wall, falls forward for a yard. Again, those plays you'll see on the replay, everybody comes underneath the blocks. You see the linebackers are all fighting underneath, and, uh, and they're trying to spill that play. So they're really playing gap control by all the defensive front guarding the inside gap. So they have them all filled. So those plays should typically bounce. And if you can get those started at the guard and TJ deep enough, he can bounce that and get some more yards. Second and 10 after no gain. Give again to TJ Williams. Here he bounces, has room to midfield, and he lowers the head and gets just across the midfield line. It'll be third and three for the Thunder as TJ Williams with his 10th carry of the game will go for 30 yards total now. And again, you mentioned earlier, Doug, Wheaton can run. They just have to stay committed to it. Yeah, nice job tackling. And the St. John's generally has been a very good tackling team all year. Today they've done a really nice job not letting the Thunder get extra yards by missed tackles. Third and three from midfield. 6.40 to go. Wheaton trailing by two scores. Snap back against four. Anthony has time. Delivers to Stone Watson. Watson breaks out of a tackle. Room to run 40. 35-30. Hurdles out of a tackle, and he's down at the 27-yard line. Nice play by the senior there. There, Just as I talk about tackling, he breaks one, and we get a big play on third down. A huge conversion to put the Thunder on the door of the red zone again. Another opportunity here to make this a one-score game. Good patience from Anthony, and a good job of throwing away from the oncoming defender. Stone Watson, a fifth-year senior, playing some of his best ball of his career. 
First and 10 from the 27. This is Watson on a play fake. Anthony back to pass. Up the wheel. Has Miller at the 10. Miller at the 5. And he's brought down from behind at the 4-yard line by James Inman. But what a throw from Anthony to Jack Miller. A great throw and a great route by Miller because uh, the secondary player, who I didn't see who the defensive player was, was all over him, breaking on this flat. And then when he breaks up, Miller does a nice job getting on top of him. There you go. Inman is the outside linebacker. Once he beats him, rather than letting him catch up next to him, he gets over the top of him, which makes him have to run around him to get there and creates that throwing lane, and, and Anthony put it right on the money. Well, here's the Hibben package, and they've reshuffled the line. They keep McGill at left tackle. It's Paul Fay at left tackle or left guard, and Watson's going to get to the one, but he's not going to get there. The other thing is, watching that replay, it's a good thing Inman made the tackle from behind because Kohler wasn't coming up no. hard enough to keep him out of that the end zone. That would have been a touchdown. So the, we talked about the Paulina getting beat there, and Wheaton makes that adjustment. They go with the freshman to keep Gabe McGill at left tackle. Again, really difficult to run between the tackles down here because they shoot all of the gaps inside. And so you have to wash things down. You have to run stuff off tackle or look to bounce it. That's really where your running game is going to be. Anthony rolling to his right. Had McJunkin at the pylon waiting, and he's going to throw it out of the back of the end zone. Had McJunkin at the end zone right away, and he didn't throw it on time. And now it's third and goal from the two, and it's getting – here comes Faye again. So they're going to load up. There are wrinkles off this package. We saw it earlier with the handoff to Watson on third and one where he ran sweep to the left side and tripped. But we'll see what they have here. Gale and I, Hibben in the backfield. You would expect pressure here from off the edge from St. John's with what they do. They like pressure in the red zone. Give is to Watson. It's Anthony on Run a naked bootleg. Anthony's going to stop. He's waiting for McJunkin. Side steps one. He's got McJunkin. Touchdown, Thunder. Luke Anthony could have run it in. Not only that, but James Inman hobbling to the sideline for yeah. St. John's there. That's a big development there. Great job by Luke. I mean, really, just when you bootleg out, you've got leverage to take off running. But he buys himself time and uh, does a nice job. And the receiver does a nice job sliding back inside to give him the lane. Griffin Bowes for the extra point here for the Thunder. Good snap, good hold, and good kick. Wheaton's back within a touchdown, 21-14, to with 4.44 left in the third quarter. So they didn't get the drive from the, on the opening drive of the, of the uh, second half. They turned the ball over, but then the defense gets a huge stop by getting pressure on Erdman. And then they give the ball back to the offense, do a good job catching the punt with, with Nichols. So the things they weren't doing right in the first half, the Thunder have done right early so far, other than the fumble and the turnover. St. John's again playing, playing great. The Thunder just making a few more plays. Developing story in Naperville. The Aggies of Delaware Valley are back within a score as well. 17-14. 14 unanswered for Del Val to start the second half, and it comes off just the fourth interception of the year thrown by Brock Rutter. Interesting. Interesting development. So, big series here. St. John's prided themselves all year on responding to opposing team scores, so I, I would anticipate them coming out pretty aggressive. Other game in action, Mary Harden Baylor trailing UW Whitewater, 17 to 7, down at the Cathedral. Well, uh, uh, Whitewater's can run the ball, and if they don't turn the ball over, they generally get turnovers, and they play great defense. They get after people, so that's not surprising. I don't know what the turnover result is down there, but fair catch called for, and it's going to come out of the end zone at the two. So bring the ball out to the 25. And his Wheaton defense, coming off a stop, need to go get themselves another one. Yes, they do, and it's a tall task from this number four ranked offense, St. John's, led by Gallardi winner Jackson Erdman. They have not run the ball much at all, St. John's, and, and really haven't even tried. Uh, their running game is effectively throwing those wide receiver screens out wide with a couple blockers in front on first down. That's the type of thing that they've liked to do. And here they come out with no backs. Five wide, and it's the slot. T.J. Hodge inside of a trips to the right side. Looking to the right side. It's behind Hodge and falls incomplete. Oof. It was an easy pitch and catch, and he just threw it behind him. Yep. We talked about the need for Wheaton, this, these front four, to be a little bit better here in the second half, and they're starting to get a little deeper into the pocket. They hit him twice on that last drive, but that group 
has to get home, and we haven't called Pat O'Connell's name in a long time. Well, Pat O'Connell, you, you've also seen him. He's not here, but he's going against that left tackle, Bart, who's really a great Looking player. left, complete to Moore, quick hit by Roland, and they're short. It's going to be third and three here for the Johnnies. And Wheaton's defense can really send a message and swing the momentum if they can get off the field here. Now you got to come up and play people kind of tight here, which sets you up with a little bit of risk. Um, but if you want to get a stop, you're going to have to come up and bump some people. Henry Trost is in the backfield on the left hip of Jackson Erdman. Four wides, Wheaton stepping off on coverage. Looking over the defense. Go. Erdman going to throw to the right side. Kennedy's got a beat on it. It's picked off. Corey Kennedy picks it off at the 42-yard line. Yeah, he read that right from the start. And again, Erdman, that was a situation where it looked to me like he decided before he caught, before they snapped the ball where he was going to throw the ball. You see him look to the left gratuitously, but he quickly snaps his head, sees that he's got that corner route, and he's going to go to it. Kennedy is broke on the ball. As soon as the ball was snapped, he was off the hash looking for that route. Nice recognition by that fifth-year senior, Corey Kennedy, and a great play. Thunder with a huge opportunity to try to go level the score. Just the ninth interception of the season for Jackson Erdman. First and 10 at their own 41, and all the momentum for the Thunder. First down play fake for Anthony. Steps up in the pocket, faces downfield. Now he will tuck it and run and get a couple of yards across to the 43-yard line. Well defended by St. John's, knowing that that's a great shot for Wheaton to take a chance downfield. Smart play. Again, Luke Anthony's always made good decisions. He doesn't turn the ball over a lot. You can see he gets and moves his feet. He's looking down the field, just tucks it, get back to the line of scrimmage, get what you can get, and live to play another day. Great job. They were trying to get... They were trying to get the running back down the rail there, and he was well covered. Looking to the right side, quick hitter, and in and out of the hands of Stone Watson. Seeing here, that it looks like trainers are taking a look at Wyatt Southall, so it's the freshman Paul Fay who's in the game at left guard, and now he rolls over, excuse me, at right guard. They keep Rodgers at left guard, so something to keep an eye on. He was a, well, he was a big to-do coming out of high school, a guy who had Big Ten walk-on offers. And he's going to be thrown into the fire here in the quarterfinals. Third and eight from the 43. they got safety over the top of Torini off to the left side. Four-man four rush for Anthony. And really it's three and a spy. And he throws it off his back leg and has completed to Nichols for a first down. What a throw and catch to Phil Nichols in the middle of the field. Yeah, Nichols came free a, little, a second or so earlier. And fortunately, St. John's didn't see him and squeezed the route. And... As soon as Anthony saw it, he was able to get rid of the ball just before the Johnny's defense closed on him. First down, big first down there on third down. Counting down on three minutes. Clock is stopped and still stopped. Clock should be rolling, I would think. First and 10 at the Johnny 49. Anthony back to pass. Well protected again. Now it breaks through. Being chased from behind. He's got Stone Watson by himself. Watson to the 40. Breaks the tackle. Big hit downfield. Still cutting back 30. Stone Watson all the way down to the 26. Big play there. Again, Stone Watson, the senior, coming up big in this game. Just kind of hiding against the Wheaton sideline. They're almost camouflaging himself with all these blue jerseys that the Johnnies kind of forgot about him. Petrzewski just lets him leak out, and Anthony finds him along the sideline. And then a big block downfield by Jack Miller. And the Wheaton offense has answered the bell early in the second half. Well, they got to again finish the drive here, and it's going to be no easy task. St. John's playing a little bit of a two deep here. The Thunder kind of abandoned the running game, so no back set. They're going to play two deep safeties with under coverage. It is T.J. Williams inside of the trips left side, and a timeout Wheaton. The play clock was down, almost about to run out. First charge timeout, Wheaton. And th those are critical timeouts to burn just because you don't get your operation up and running and you got to get the call in in time in order to make those calls. So you, you burn that because you don't want to get the penalty. I understand it, but on the flip side, in a game like this, you got a one-score game. You get, you're going down to try to, to try to tie this thing. You got to get the operation in. You got to get the operation in because you need those timeouts at the end of this game potentially, as as you try to manage the clock. 
Brock Rudder answers and atones for his own mistake, finds Andrew Kaminsky for 11 yards, 24-14. Cardinals over the Aggies of Delaware Valley. They go to the fourth quarter in Belton. Whitewater still a two-score lead, 17-7 over Mary Harden Baylor. Winner of this game faces the winner of that game in next week's semifinals on ESPN3. And again, the winner of this game, if it's Whitewater, is getting a home game. If it's Mary Harden Baylor, you assume that the winner of this game is getting shipped to Texas. So first and 10 from the 26-yard line of the Johnnies. We'll see what Wheaton calls after the timeout. T.J. Watson in the backfield on the left hip of Anthony. Torini to the right. Nichols inside of Carson Lee left. They're looking left. Quick hitter to Nichols. Complete. Good block from Lean, and Nichols gets inside the 20. They'll give him right at the 20, but a good block from Carson Lean to give him a little room out there. Again, similar play to what St. John's runs out there. Uh, it's a little bit of a flat pass or a screen with a blocker out in front. It's a great running type of a play. It's a ball possession type of a play. You throw it out there, you get seven yards on first down. That's a nice result. Nichols about 75 yards shy of a hundred of a thousand yards. Torini, uh, 25 yards shy of a thousand yards. Anthony's going to drop under center. Play clock's down to six. Stretch play to T.J. Williams it. behind Jake Hibben. T.J. to the 15, and you will be ushered out of bounds. A nice play there by Chris Harris. He came off the block late, and he stopped T.J. from turning the corner, but not before Williams gets his first down at the 15-yard line. Nice job. Move the sticks. Down in the red zone. Got to, got to execute down here. Both sides. That was Harris standing up. Adam Torini. These physical corners working against the run blocking of the Wheaton wide receivers. A little surprised they don't throw like a quick out into the short side here over where Torini is against a single receiver because there's inside leverage off man here. Play fake for Anthony. Rushing to the near side. Has Watson. And just a little too far ahead of him, it looked. But if it completes it, I think Watson can waltz into the end zone. Yeah, he's, he's motioning to Watson. He wanted him to come a little flatter. It gives him a little more angle. See, he's angling more towards the pylon, which the defender's in the throwing lane. If you flatten that route out a little bit, he can put it out there for you to catch it, and then you can turn up. So it's just it's little tiny things that make huge difference on the difference between a completion and what could have been a touchdown. Alex Sai is running in coverage with Stone Watson on that play. Second and ten at the 15, final minute of the third quarter. Could be a tight end pass here. This is something a set that they ran again before and hit the tight end off play action. Double tight. Give to Stone Watson running left. Watson to the 10. Watson's going to be close to a first down. Stood up out of bounds. It's going to depend on where he stepped out. I think he's a yard shy at the six. So it'll be third and a yard for the Thunder. Clock runs, 50 seconds left, third quarter. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's too early to call this, you know, two down, four down territory or but not. Your, your offense has momentum. Three. They do. What could be the final play of the third quarter here? Third and one at the six. Stone Watson in the backfield, twins right. Tucker inside of Lean. Nichols inside of Torini left. They've got a safety over the top of each duo. Going to swing it out to Stone Watson. Watson steps up and dives forward. He should have a first down. Wow, that's a bad spot, though. That is a bad spot. He had stretched it to the five. It's going to be fourth and less than a yard, and Wheaton will have the quarter break to think about it. That's into the third quarter. Really a bad spot there. They should have gotten the benefit of the first down, and you know the the official done a good job. But that time, the, I think Wheaton got the short end on a on a bad spot. Going to bring up a huge decision here for Coach Mike Swider on fourth and less than a yard. Twenty to seven, the lead for Whitewater a minute into the fourth quarter. The Cardinals of North Central again just adding on, leading Delaware Valley twenty four to fourteen. Wheaton shuts out the Johnnies in the third quarter. And they really moved the ball well. They were going in to score, got stripped at the 8, come back and score on the next drive. And now they've got it down at the 6-yard line. But Wheaton holding them to 16 yards of offense there in the half while piling up oh, looks like about 150 of their own. Yeah, a chance to equalize the game is not going to mean anything if they don't get points or a touchdown really here. 
So they're talking about what kind of play. I'm sure Coach Swider's conferring with Jesse Scott. The decision's already been made because Swider's not even in the huddle. Jesse Scott's out there talking to the offense, so pretty clear they're going for it. Well, one thing we have not seen out of that package is the handoff to Hibben. We haven't seen it since he went biling into the end zone at North Park. So, I mean, that's, that's an option, getting your first guy in and letting him get as quick as you can. Yeah, if you're going to run the middle, you've got to either run a quarterback sneak or a quick hitter because they're going to come hard off the edges underneath all those blocks and really pinch the entire defense onto that mesh point. So you either have to fake that and go outside off tackle, or you got to get a quick hitter on a quarterback sneaker or a quick dive. First, we've seen Wyatt Southall back in in, the, in this game here in the second half. Got banged up early in the half, and Paul Fay was filling in at right guard. But Southall's out there. It'll be fourth and less than a yard from the sixth, and I don't like that they're out of the shotgun here. Well, one play they've run out of, out of this, well, not out of the shotgun, that's true. Unless you see Anthony run forward and quickly snap and quarterback sneak. Nichols will come in motion to the left side. Shotgun snap, speed option right. Anthony pitches it out to, Nick, to TJ. He's got the first down. Down inside the four to the three. It didn't look like there was much room, but TJ stuck his foot in the ground, and that quick burst that you're used to seeing from him gets him just enough. Boy, and I don't really like running option into the short side either. Great job by Torini to, to hold off because the corner out there, I can't see if that was Hughes. But a, a really a great job there. Something to watch here. Anthony off the field. This is Matthew Tucker, not Jeremiah Tucker, in a Wildcat package for the Thunder. First, we've seen Matthew Tucker running this set. First and goal from the three. Seven-man front for the Thunder. Play fake. It's a sweep behind him, and Matthew Tucker into the end zone. Touchdown, Thunder. Great execution there by the Thunder. Again, a lot of little things going on here that make a big difference, but the Thunder just an extra point away from tying this game up. We got the ball game we were hoping for. Great execution throughout the third quarter to start the fourth by the Thunder to shape up to be what's going to be a, an epic game here. But on that, on that third down and short, really important. The, the Torini was out there on the, uh, on the defensive back for, the, for St. John's. Tommy Dieters, extra point is good. Tommy Dieters was playing a man-to-man, -man, but as Dieters should on short yardage, he's playing a man, but he's got his head inside so he can come off and help on the tackle. Torini recognized that because usually that receiver releases outside right there. Well, that's a touchdown run. But usually the receiver releases outside and, the, and expecting the defensive back to turn with him and have his back to the play. This time, Dieters does a great job keeping his eyes in. This is the third down and one. But Torini recognizing that stays engaged and blocks him and allows him just enough for Williams, TJ, to get that first down, which set up the touchdown. So little tiny things making a huge difference here in this game, and they will down the stretch undoubtedly. So we're right back to where we started. Wheaton with 14 unanswered here in the second half, and they tie the game at 21. They've trailed since the opening possession. St. John's took the kickoff, went 75 yards on the opening drive. Ravi Alston with a touchdown catch. Wheaton trailed 21 to seven at halftime. They scored two of the three times they have the ball on the Wheaton defense. Now with a stop and a turnover, coming back out and it's going to fall on the best defense in the country to stop maybe the best quarterback in the country and give this team a chance to take the lead. As Bo is going to pound this thing over the head of Trost. And here we go. Yeah, this third this third and beginning of the fourth quarter, the Wheaton defense, certainly their front, has made some plays. Dallas McCray with a sack, a couple tackles for loss. So as much as the St. John's offensive and defensive lines, I think, really controlled the game in the first half. The same credit should be given to Wheaton and early in this second. They've controlled the line of scrimmage, and that's why you have an even ball game right now. Big student section here, and a lot of the football alumni are trying to get this crowd to rise with them. Open backfield for Erdman on first and 10 for the Johnnies at the 25. Pitch sweep to Trost, and Ryan Schwartz is right there. He stops him. McCray will wrap him up and drop him back Flag at the 20. Down. Late flag, it came at the line of scrimmage. We'll see what the call is. I don't know if, if the running back got raked across the face or a face mask could be, or, or could be a hold out here. St. John's is retreating. I think this is a hold. Now the question comes, it's a three-yard loss. Do you put them behind the chains Personal and take foul, them out? hands in the face. Defense number 47. 15-yard wow. penalty. Automatic first down. Pat McCray getting his hands to the face, being blocked. Yeah, he was being blocked by the... Uh, by the All-American Ben Barch, that big left tackle, and just trying to fight his way to hold ground. 
and his hands got up around the shirt, and I think they slipped off the shirt up into the face mask. Huge play right there. Big, big play. Yeah, that changes things significantly. It would have been either first and 20 or second and 13. Instead, it's first and 10 out to the 40. Offense good enough that they don't need help, but Wheaton's giving it to them anyhow. Erdman's going to send both tight ends to the right. That's Kempner and Johnson. And motion now comes from Hodge. Throw. Hodge is going to throw. throw. Kennedy's trying to get to him quickly. The ball's loose. If they can get to it, he's going to throw it up for grabs. And it'll roll into the Wheaton sideline. Wheaton all over it. They looked like it was setting up as a throwback to Erdman, but Kennedy closed ground before he could get the hips back behind. And a smart play also by T.J. Hodge to have the presence of mind to throw this away. Well, and Spencer Rowland, great job on in coverage there on Alston. Just stayed off of him. He saw the play develop. He did not come up and run support. He stayed back, and Alston tried to come out and pretend he was going to run block him and then get by him. Really smart and heady play by Rowland. Second and 10 at the 40. Four-man rush. Erdman looking left. It's incomplete in and out of the hands of Jack Kempner, who I think ran that route a little deeper than he should have. And now a big third and ten. Wheaton's got all the momentum and the crowd rising here at McCauley Stadium. This has been a battle of half so far. The ebbs and the flows. St. John's really controlling most of the first half and the thunder up to now control in the second half. Big opportunity here for the St. John's offense. Huge opportunity obviously for the Wheaton defense. Big play in the game here in the fourth quarter of a tie game. And they go empty backfield, five wide, trips right. Pressure comes in the face of Erdman and it's incomplete! Erdman hit by Schwartz. The wide receiver never saw the throw. They overrun the offensive line and Wheaton's getting the ball back with a chance to take the lead. Great stop, big time stop there. They, they sold out on that one. They were gonna get to him and they played bump coverage so that there was no, really nowhere to throw the ball. Erdman knew he had to get the ball out of his hands because he had unblocked players. There's more guys coming than they had in the block, which means you gotta get the ball out. Wheaton had tight coverage, great opportunity here. Low snap, skips into Mills, picks it up, gets a nice kick away. Nichols makes the catch at the 28, and he's going to be dropped immediately. But again, the important thing is he made the catch. Indeed. I'm a little surprised Wheaton's not bringing pressure because that's a couple snaps in a row that have skipped in to the freshman punter. If you put fresh pressure on a freshman with the momentum working against, that could be a big play coming. That's true, but you still have to bring pressure through that the big man wedge sitting back there, and that's just hard to do. You know, there's kind of three guys up there that are offensive lineman types and immovable object. It's really hard to block a punt through that. you got to come off the edge, which you could do, but that's, again, what they're trying to avoid. So, Torini going to motion out to the left side. First and 10 for Wheaton on its own 28, having scored the last 14. Anthony's back to pass. He's going to dump it off. Wide open was Miller, and he threw it behind him. Ah, and he knows it. Missed opportunity there. Would have been about a 15-yard gain with a catch and run at least. But again, the offensive line giving Luke Anthony a ton of time on these play-action passes. Trips to the left side on second down for the Thunder. And again, it becomes big even if you're not going to score it, that you can at least get a first down and help turn the field against St. John's. Give us to Stone. Watson on a counter. Watson to the 30. 30. My balls come. Ball's loose, and St. John's is going to pick it up at their own 46-yard line. Was going to be wow. a first down run by Watson. Big play there. And it got knocked loose. Again, in a, in a game like this, quarterfinal matchup, two top 10 teams, you know, um, huge game and with a lot of implications. Turnovers are going to be the difference Richard at key Car times. Richard Caravo got the punch on the ball. Chris Harris picked it up. Really happy that the Thunder stayed with the running game there. I was just about to note that they've so far, right before that play, run 31 passes and just 24 runs. They're more balanced than that, so I wanted to see them stay to the running game. They did there, but unfortunately, Stone wasn't able to secure the ball. First and 10 from the 46. Wheaton defense going to have to make another stop. Erdman going to backpedal. Schindeldecker dropped at his ankles, rolling to his left. He's going deep, got a man, man coverage, and it's complete. Blake Patrick just shucked Robbie Schwartz. 
And it's into the end zone, a 54-yard touchdown on the first play. Injury timeout. And St. John's has a man down as well. A second big play by Blake Patrick of the, of the game. And he gives Wheat and St. John's the lead back. Schindeldecker got dropped there at the feet of Erdman, who stopped just shy of the line of scrimmage. And you're not going to see but Patrick just getting on top of Schwartz. And St. John's delivers a big blow there as Wheaton had the momentum. A big play turns into a turnover. And on the first play, the Johnnies go 54 yards. Well, again, you, you have a defense. And the extra point is blocked. Ball still loose, but it's a big play. We talked earlier, Wheaton or St. John struggles with the kicking game and blocked kicks. That one never had a chance. It came out low, about chest high. And so now if Wheaton can score, an extra point could give him the lead. Uh, that's a big play there. Well, they had the guy break three, break free. The protection wasn't good. That's Wyatt Lee. But again, you got, uh, in terms of the touchdown, you have... Wheaton's defense is set up to get pressure on the front four and to avoid the big play in the back, on the back end, and, and play coverage. And they were playing coverage there. The problem is Erdman is the best in the country at pushing the ball deep. He was able to break the pressure and buy time, and then the coverage starts to break down. It's just hard to keep guys in front of you that long, and you end up with single coverage on these deep balls because you have two multiple receivers deep and everybody's trying to cover them. And there you had Robbie Schwartz against uh, Patrick and uh, Robbie just kind of fell down. So great play and, and great throw there by Erdman. He is the best in the country throwing the ball deep uh, to, to his receivers. He threw a ball that was going to be catchable uh, by his guy, and both players looking up, and, and our guy, the Thunder guy, fell down, and Patrick made a play. Patrick, with two huge plays, comes into this game, as I mentioned earlier, with just two catches, and now he's had... I think four on the day, two of them for long touchdowns. This is going to be Tucker from the 10 up the left sideline to the 20. And Tucker we're going to be pushed out of bounds into the Wheaton sideline at the 27 or so. So now the Wheaton offense that has been moving the ball really well in the second half has a chance in an opening, even though they're trailing. St. John's has opened the door now that a touchdown and an extra point could put Wheaton ahead. Well, that's a big if. The Thunder have turned the ball over a couple times in the second half here despite two scores. So they've had four possessions, two touchdowns, two turnovers. they got to hang on to the ball and keep making plays. Jackson Erdman has gone over 11,000 yards passing in his career today. First and 10 from the 27. They move the defensive line down. Pressure looks like it's coming from Pietruski. Give is to T.J. Williams. Williams going to bounce to the near side, spins back into the 30, and he'll get three on first down. It should be noted that um, for St. John's, Inman, who hobbled off a couple series ago, has not reappeared. Yeah, it's Will Sontag, the junior, who's taken over. That's a big blow for the Johnnies because uh, Inman is, a, is an all-Mayak all player. Burt McJunkin motioning back to the left side. Second and seven from the 30. Safety is walked down. Play fake to get it to Nichols. Nichols just going to break out of a tackle and power ahead to the 40. But we've seen it. Nichols is a as hard a runner in a small package as you're going to yeah. find. That's just a senior saying he's going to make a play. He's limping a little bit there, but that's just a senior saying, I'm getting this first down right now. Fighting for everything. Nichols goes over 50 yards receiving on the day. The Wheaton's got three receivers over 50 yards. Stone Watson, their leading receiver, five catches, 55 yards. Blake Patrick leading for the Johnnies. He's caught two touchdown passes, three catches, 135 yards. First and 10. Play fake for Anthony against four. Drops off underneath and a dangerous pass and a nice job by T.J. Williams to make that catch. That's a ball that can easily turn into an interception when you miss high. Yeah. So Thunder running a lot of play action on first down. I'd like to see him actually run the ball on first down a little bit. I, I think they need to stay with the running game uh, and, and just use the size and the power of this offensive line. See if you can wear these guys down. One big long drive would be uh, a great for Thunder fans here, obviously. Big down here, second and long. Whitewater has added to its lead almost 27-7 to now. Extra point pending with only four and a half minutes left. So the winner of this game all of a sudden is staring down a possible home game in the semis. 
TJ Williams rolls to the right hip of Anthony. Pressure from the Johnnies. And a give to TJ. TJ looking for a hole. 45 fighting. He's going to be get, get nice to the run. 48, and it'll be third and short. Nice run against Blitz there. They're bringing guys, and when you bring guys, if you can break the line of scrimmage, there's going to be room to run because those are all cutback players that are blitzing. So nice job there. Patient run, staying in between. Really one, one guy away from making that even a much bigger run. Third and a yard, and this has been an, a, an area where Wheaton has struggled today. Williams in the backfield with Anthony. We'll see if St. John's dials up some pressure. They will. Play fake. Anthony's back. It's only a four-man rush. He has a man wide open. It's Nichols. Nichols stiff arms a tackler. He's going to hold on to the ball inside the 30. Ball comes out at the end, but he's ruled down at the 27. Nichols just a playmaker and, you know, doing a great job. What he does, what a senior um, all-conference player. How, by the way, he's a second-team all-conference CCIW player, and if he's not an all-american type player i don't know who is he's yeah, one that of the injury, best receivers that injury even forcing him to miss the last three games really cost him the first team him and tj both really the injury slowing both of them down down the stretch and relegating them to second team status first and ten at the 27 bunch left with Torini and nichols and a play fake again for anthony anthony going left has Torini caught get out of bounds and he does learned his lesson he spins out should be enough for a first down, and it is. Down to the 16. But again, these are similar to what we talked about early, Doug. They're only bringing four. They've got seven. Yeah. Wheaton's staying in to protect. They've got guys guarding space, and Wheaton's taking advantage. Again, Wheaton has not led in this game. They've scored 14 straight to pull even. Had the ball and a turnover and a quick score for St. John's, but then the extra point was blocked. Again, look for a tight end pass here. This is an area where St. John's likes to bring pressure. And they do. Get, give us to Williams. Williams inside of the 10, and he's down to the 8-yard line. They, they slanted down on that yep. side, and it was the right play and call. That's exactly, we talked about this. You know, we talked about bouncing those plays because they come underneath. Look at them come underneath everything. Bounce that thing, get right outside, and just push. And T.J. Williams kind of got landed on that ankle that's been a struggle for him. But again, he he's, looks like he's closer to the guy we're seeing, but now they're going to have to maybe get him retaped and get him feeling good about it again. Second and two from the seven as Stone Watson into the backfield. This is where you draw up a play. You, you work a play you've been working here to try to get something. Anthony on the draw. Anthony to the five. Anthony into the end zone. Touchdown, Thunder. And that's the type of play I'm talking about that you have on your play sheet for this situation in the late game situation that you need a play. And you got one of your best playmakers. Not a, th That might be one of the first design runs we've seen Luke Anthony run all season long. Maybe there's been one other, but to run a quarterback draw right there, big time call by Jesse Scott. And that turns the McCulley Stadium faithful loose and a big extra point now. Wheaton just blocked one, it's a fumbled snap. Bickle breaks out, he's rolling to his right, he throws it into the end zone, it's intercepted. Wow. Man, they had, wow. Bickle's been so good on the, on the holds all year. He fumbles the hold, and we're back even again. Well, it's kind of appropriate that this is going to be two heavyweights slugging it out down the stretch here with 8.22 to go in a tie game. Man, the door wide open. And a fumbled snap, and we're right back where we started, 27-27. But remember, this is a game that Wheaton trailed 21-7 at halftime. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about a, a, an extra point operation that's 72 for 75 on the year. Uh, I mean, the odds are just insane. He's above 95% on the year and converting those extra points. And in the key moment of the season, you got to convert it. You get really what's only the, the only bobble snap you've had. You'd like to see him just... Well, you know, he wasn't going to get anywhere because of the inside pressure, but... Yeah, he took, took so long to roll out, too. I don't even know that he had a fire call on. Well, there's no fire call. Just the only hope was if that inside blitzer who tackled him had uh, taken a wrong angle, he could have taken off and potentially run it in. Yeah, and also good that he took the knee because there's always the chance for return. As Bose, as he has all day, drives this one into the end zone. Or did it? Oh, it yeah. is a, wow, there was going to be some judgment Fortunate. there. That's pretty Fortunate. close to the pylon. Yeah, it flew over the inside of the pylon. You could just barely tell, but actually it was pretty close. The ref was right on it, though, so 
another good call there. So St. John's, Jackson Erdman, if you're a St. John's fan, you got everything you wanted here. You got your All-American Gillardi winner on offense with the ball. 8.22 to go. Everything's out in front of him. Coming off a touchdown on his last possession. The St. John's offense has got to be feeling really confident. Defense obviously needs to get a stop. Five wide receivers. Trips left with Hodge inside. We bring the four. Erdman, pump fake, pocket collapsing, looking for room to run, and it collapses around him. Wheaton wraps him up, and down he'll go for the third time today. Nice job of Wheaton maintaining pocket composure on yeah. the rush and not letting him escape. Yeah, keeping leverage by the defensive end so he can't get outside. He wanted to go outside right here. Patrick O'Connell just holding off on Barch there. Tough. He, he hasn't gotten much pressure, but right there he kept leverage. with the, He got to the quarterback level and stayed with him, which made him go back inside, allowed those defensive tackles to come back and make that play. And a nice job by Holiday. He doesn't over-pursue upfield, just holds his line, knowing help is coming from behind. It's a loss of two. Third sack of the day for the Thunder. Second and 12 for the Johnnies as we hit the midway point of the fourth quarter. We thought this would be a classic. It has been. Now they know it's zone, so he's going to Pump fake, he's looking across the middle. He's got his man up the sideline. It's Moore who makes a catch. He pump faked just enough to Hodge to open that up down the sideline. And Moore, who has been hitting the underneath routes all day, gets a big one into Wheaton territory. And now St. John's quickly to the line. Trying to run some quick game. Still with the running back in the slot to the short side here. Inside of Patrick, who's been the big play guy for the Johnnies. Erdman back to pass again, looking to the right side, complete to Patrick, and he will be wrapped up immediately, but another first down. Inside the 25 to the 24th. Clock will stop at 7.05 as the chains reset. Nice change of pace here by the Johnnies to, to go no huddle and try to speed it up and tire out this wheat in front, maybe give Erdman a little bit more time to throw the ball. Looking left, complete to Alston. Sidesteps, and I think he sacrificed some room. They're going to give him forward progress, but that's a... That's he did, but again, look at this down in distance. You got second and three around that 30-yard line. This is where Erdman's taking his shot into the end zone. He's done it on three different occasions and made two of them. So that's what I look for right here. You got to be really smart on what you're doing here. It's actually a pretty good spot watching the replay. He catches that ball about two yards ahead and then backpedals. Second and three from the 37. Looking across the middle, pressure comes with McCray, and it's too high, intended for Moore, who got drilled by Kennedy. McCray's got a big hit on the quarterback, and we've got a man down in the right, right where the ball was thrown. It's that's not a, Erdman. That's, that's Newman, I believe, the that's center. That's the center, and he's not Andrew even moving. Well, Boy, he's not moving at all. Well, he's moving his arms, but Nick Newman is the man down as we look around the country. North Central continues to lead Delaware Valley 24-14. to They've got the ball at the Aggie 12-yard line. Rudders 22 of 31 for 258 and two touchdowns. Greenfield, who was banged up in the fourth quarter at Mount Union, has 25 carries and 82 yards in a very workmanlike game. And with a minute and 57 seconds left, Whitewater has the ball leading Mary Harden Baylor 26 to 7. Yeah, that's in the book that one. Yeah, we're going to put that one on the board and wait for the final score. So UW Whitewater going to travel to the winner of this game in next week's semifinals. So St. John's will trot out Tyler Otto as the center. He is a senior, 5'10", 280 pounder out of Maple Lake, Minnesota, went to Monticello High School. Senior in the St. John's program, so he's going to know all the calls and be well versed. Uh, in what he's doing here, but obviously a big loss because uh, Newman is a uh, two-time first-team All-Mayak player and one of the leaders of that offensive line. Good sign for the Johnnies. Newman was able to walk off under his own power. Was flanked by the athletic training staff, but was walking on his own. So, so third, third and three from the 27 here. So again, you got probably what's four down territory. This is where Erdman likes to take a shot, and they've had plenty of opportunity to talk about it. 84 is a tight end. They like to throw when he's the tight end on the line. They have both tight ends to the right side. Wheaton showing pressure. Play fake for Erdman. Pressure breaks free in his face. He's looking for the tight end, and it's caught. It would have been pass interference. They're wrestling for the football. It should be a touchdown, and it is. Sigler got boxed out by the tight end. And Jackson Erdman doing Jackson Erdman things. Well, we do have a flag down, though, at the line of scrimmage. That could have been offsides. We jumped a little bit. Are you 
That looks like it's coming in from the side. If it's on no St. John's, it's offside. There are two fouls in the nope. play. Offside, defense, yep. that penalty is declined. So it'll be a touchdown. Pass interference, defense. That's also declined. There's all the play is a touchdown. Wheaton had the pressure coming through, and it was looked like it was Wyatt Lee was offside. They got Urban to throw it off his back foot, but they had the big man, Jack Kempner, with a box-out position and no help over the top, and Sigler was going to get flagged either way. He was just trying to do all he could to fight to the front of Jack Kempner. Well, and Kempner, when he's the guy on the line, he's the guy they want to throw the ball to often. He's the receiving tight end of the two. Uh, the other tight end was in there to help protect, to get maximum protection off the blitz. And again, great job by uh, Erdman just to put the ball up where only his guy can get it. And he, he knew the matchups. He knew what he was getting. And he's done a great job. I mean, you can see why the guy's one of the, if not the best quarterback, certainly one of the best quarterbacks in the country. A little surprised Wheaton didn't bring everybody on that extra point after they just broke free, broke three, but they dropped four or five guys, maybe anticipating something of a fake given the low kicks that have been coming out. So St. John's answers the call. And after the failed extra points on the last two touchdowns, they lead again by seven with 6.07 to play. So s nice job by St. John's to stem the tide for uh, what was the momentum changer. Wheaton seemingly had all the momentum in the early in this fourth quarter. St. John's with a couple of touchdowns in the fourth quarter to answer and retake the lead. And now it's on the Thunder to go down and make some plays here. 6.07 left to go. Plenty of time. Two timeouts for the Thunder. Three for the St. John's. And we're going to have a slugfest here. Guy, both sides are banged up you got guys limping off and then trying to run back on uh, hoping all your best players are going to be available for the end of this game because it's fixing to be a shootout and it's worth remembering that drive was a drive that started with a sack that was negated by a hands to the face penalty short kickoff rushing up Magnuson takes it at the 17 right up the right hash quickly to the 30 and he's going to be brought down shy of the 35 so decent field position to start the drive for the Thunder and an offense that's had some success here in the second half they've actually pulled even with St. John's in total offense they were trailing by about 130 yards at the halftime break and some of this will also depend on the health of T.J. Williams' ankle, even though he's right back out to start the drive. So still no Inman for St. John's. You got Will Sontag at that outside linebacker spot, who's a junior, 5'11", 195-pound junior. Came in with 22 tackles and 2.5 and tackles for loss into this game. That pass puts Erdman over 400 yards for the third straight game. Anthony is under center, sends Miller in motion to the backfield. Play fake. Deep in the pocket, all day to throw. Pressure coming, and he's going to wrap up the ball, but he's going to go down. Yeah, you got to get rid of you it. You talk about the clock with Erdman. That's Petrzewski that makes the play, but you've got to know at that point you've well, got to take off. And the Thunder have been running play action on almost every first down for the last two quarters. So I, run the ball. If you're going to run it, run it. Play action really only works if you actually run the ball, and they haven't been handing the ball off much. Ninth sack of the season for Petrzewski, and the first time that they've brought Luke Anthony down. They've had him wrapped up a couple times, but haven't been able to finish the deed. Five and a half minutes left. St. John's has just taken a 34-27 lead. Showing pressure, they back off and bring five. Anthony going to be flushed again, wrapped up, throws it up, and it's caught by oh. Perini, or is it? He caught it. He bobbled wow. it and caught it wow. at the 41-yard line. That is just a massive play right there by Torini, who looked like he wasn't going to catch that ball. And he's shaking up a little bit. And I was more worried he's going to shovel that thing right into the gut of a defender because he was surrounded on the play. That pass is going to put Adam Torini over 1,000 yards receiving on the season. Third and two for the Thunder. And now Torini is going to come off the field as they go double tight. Nichols right and lean in. left. Plenty of time on the play clock. Single back is T.J. Williams. They will give to TJ running right. TJ has a seam inside, hurdles over tacklers, and he's brought down shy of midfield. So good to see TJ put his foot in the ground and get up field after he came off the field, nursing that ankle a little bit on the last drive. Again, it's the strength of the defense. They're running behind the pull in center. That's Jake Hibben leading the way on the outside. Both these teams battling every single play for every block, for every handoff, every run, every completion, every tackle. Just a ton of emotion, ton of guys just fighting for everything here. The season on the line for both teams, down on the side of four minutes to go after this play. Thunder down seven. Miller out, McJunkin on. 
Play fake again for Anthony. Steps up, well protected, trying to take a shot. It's double coverage. Torini knocks it away from both guys. Just smart by Torini. Knew he wasn't going to bring it in, so he just knocked it away from both defenders. Well, it looked like Tommy Dieters came over, and he might have been the one that knocked it away. He came over and wasn't going to quite get there for the interception, but he came across yeah, you're right. and got his hand on it. Nice play there. And throwing into double cover, don't really like that. St. John's done a great job not giving up the big play themselves, making you earn it. So the Thunder have got to bear down and go earn every one of these plays. you got to get five yards, four yards, three yards, whatever you got to do, you got to get a first down here. And this is going to be a drive that I think similar to the end of Mount Union North Central is going to come all the way down to the end of the clock, the way Wheaton is taking its time. 3.55 to go. Stretch T.J. Williams to the left side. T.J. looking for room. He has it. Tries to bounce, and they're going to stack him up. That was one where he's just got to get to the sideline and get as much as you can, but they stack him up on the cutback for only a yard, and it's third and nine. Run the clock. Lacasse, Lacasse. Motion in his hand. He wants that clock to run. He knows the situation here. Three and a half minutes to go. Thunder on a big third down. This is going to be four down territory undoubtedly. Yeah, as much time as this taking him three minutes just to this far. Trips to the right side. Split left. Torini. And now Nichols will balance the set two and two. Safety Kohler is walked down five yards off the ball. They bring pressure. It's picked up. Anthony's got Torini on a stop, and it's caught for a first down. What a route by Torini. He boxes out the corner and then comes back for enough for a first down. Great job there. Great throw down into his belly where no one can get it but him. High level of accuracy from both quarterbacks today. Luke Anthony now 27 of 28 of 38. 285 yards. Erdman, 27 of 38 for 407. He had 250 at halftime. Give again to Stone Watson. Watson will bounce to the outside. Watson turns the corner to the 35, and he gets into that the should same. should be 15. And it is. 15 free yards. Really the un not a smart play at all. He hit him when he was well into the white. And that's just going to be the second penalty of the game against St. John's. They've both been personal fouls, and they've both been big. One was the roughing the punter, and that one will be a late hit out of bounds for 15 more. Yep. And that was Caribou who came in and put a shoulder into the chest of Stone Watson late. After the play, personal foul, unnecessary roughness, late hit out of bounds. Defense number seven. And they're going to give it to Tommy Dieters. And Coach Fashion arguing that it shouldn't have been called, but he's wrong. I mean, I, that was that's a call every official is going to make almost every time. Wheaton's got to be careful now with two and a half minutes. Both Wheaton's got two timeouts. St. John says three. You don't want to give Jackson Erdman any time. You got to get the ball into the end zone and well, be careful not to give him time. Unless you're going to go for two in the win. You might. Jack, you were going to see Jackson Erdman again, which Swider has been known to do. So, First and ten at the 18. Clock rolls inside of two and a half. This is Watson. Cuts it back, and he's held around the waist. A really nice play made there by Danny Petruszewski, not letting Stone Watson cut that back, and he holds him to three yards. Yeah, Petruszewski, really good recognition there. He's got quarterback, but he's so quick and explosive. He he checks Luke Anthony, and then he falls back into the play, grabbing him and holds him to just that two-and-a-half-yard gain. Second and eight. This is Watson behind him in 15, and he spirals down at the 10. It'll be third and short coming up for the Thunder, but most importantly... Seconds rolling that Jackson Erdman's not going to have at the back end if we Chris can push Harris this in. coming in making a huge Entry play as Carson Lean was trying to push him out. Chris Harris, the, the All American corner, came in and just got enough of of uh, his leg to, to bring him down. Ryan Lacoste was shaking up on the play. And again, they, when you have these two teams, I, I've said this a f couple of times, but I, I got to emphasize. It's a battle of attrition. These are two great Division Three football teams, two of the top in the country, battling out for a win to go to the semifinals, to host the semifinals with Whitewater winning today. Uh, and you got guys going down. You want both teams at full strength, but you know you, you just hope everybody can be healthy because whoever comes out of this game, you want them at full strength for next week. Saint, or North Central has scored with three minutes left, 31 to 14. So we're putting the Cardinals on the board into the final four. They'll go to Muhlenberg next week. Muhlenberg. Third down and short. Huge down. play right here. Third and two at the 10. T.J. Williams alone back. It's a quick hitter to Tucker. Pitch back to T.J. Williams. Williams on the sweep. He's going to get the first down. No, I don't know if he is. 
Yeah, they got it. That's some creativity there from Jesse Scott. That's not a great spot. It should be enough, though. We're waiting them to move it. I think you might bring them out. Clock is stopped temporarily with a minute 14 left. Timeout for measurement. Wow. There's been a lot of the measurements have I really mean, been the biggest thing that this crew has. TJ's just got to put his foot in the ground and get his shoulder pad down and get that yard. I mean, there should have been no question given how that play was run. Looked like he got caught in between steps and couldn't really lower it in. This is going to be a big spot in this game, obviously. They no, be short. He's short by the nose. This is going to be fourth down. Yeah, these are all of about three inches short. Can't be many. He's not holding many chain links between that. This, I think this needs to be line Jake Hibben up behind Luke Anthony and shove the quarterback forward. Here comes the big package. Well, not not the not the full big package though. It's Brink into the game. Gale and McJunkin come in as well. I, I like something off tackle more than I like something up the middle, just because of the way that St. John's plays these short yardage situations. You're going to get single coverage out here, so you could sell out and go for nickels. You wouldn't want to run a fade. You want to try to beat him on a slant, but Harris is a savvy guy, so play clock hasn't even started yet. Yeah, they're still setting everybody back up as they have to bring the chains back out. Jesse Scott's going to call a timeout here with Second a minute 14 charge, left. Wheaton. And again, it makes sense. The clock's under a spot where you can stop it anyhow. You've got plenty of time with how much field is left, so only one timeout for the last 74 seconds for the Thunder. you got a number of play. We haven't done many quarterback sneaks, so that just hasn't been our fourth and short go-to. You know, we've usually done something with our speed guys to the outside. Now St. John's is going to have seen us do that in these key situations, so, you know, they're probably talking about the exact same things. One of the plays we've seen out of Wheaton in this situation is fake the jet sweep and then run kind of a fake jet sweep toss to TJ to the, the other opposite the jet sweep and just let him outrun whoever that player is because the jet sweep motion guy is going to bring a player across if they're playing man. So that's a play we've seen in the past. You could see the Hibben package in here, which is All-American center Jake Hibben in the backfield. The thing that's been concerning is this is also a spot where he's like to hand that little end around to McJunkin from behind. So we'll see what package comes out. Season on the line for the Thunder, fourth and a yard. Fourth and less than a yard. It's about three inches at the St. John's Hibben, nine yard Hibben line. Hibben package is in. This might even be a handoff to Hibben, even though they're opening up the left side of the center. They've got nobody there. Now they shut down. They're gonna, everyone's going to pinch. Give it to Hibben straight ahead. Hibben down inside the five, and he stretches it to the three. We wow. talked about it earlier. Jake Hibben, the big man, fired up. That's a center carry to extend the season, and the clock will run a little more if you're Wheaton. Be careful not to snap this play too early. Yeah. You've got plenty of time where you're at on the field. Yeah. I think Jesse Scott is smart. He's taking a second to even call the play in. Hibben staying in the backfield. This is still too early for this play, it feels. Hibben again. Hibben hurtling down to the one-yard line. Wow. Just keep feeding him. <laughs> Listen to the crowd respond to the big man. Jake Hibben trying to have a Piesman moment here at the end of this game. They're swapping out into more of a goal line look now. So they just brought an extra defensive. They brought Sontag off the field, and they brought in uh, Seth Morum into the line. This is their goal line package. 30 seconds left. Second and goal. Hibben. Hibben into the end zone. Touchdown, Thunder. Well, they didn't signal, but it sure looked like he was in. He's over the body. Oh, my gosh, he's short. He's on top of bodies, and the clock's running. Clock's running. 15 seconds left. Well, you now they stop it with 12. Man, it looked like it looked like his top half of his body is, a f is past the end zone. By a lot. Yeah, that's a terrible spot. Third charge timeout. Wheaton. And he turns around and throws his hands up. He knows he's in. Third and maybe an inch from. <laughs> so what you got to do, you got to call two plays, because if you're going to run the dive again, you got to get off and get. And you may not have enough time to run two plays with 12 seconds yes. in this, because there's going to be a pile up if you in fact do it. So. Well, I think this. You. You. Yeah. I don't. You almost have to score on this one because you're right. They're going to lay on guys. 
They're going to be slow to get up if they don't score. Now, the thing is, they haven't stopped him in anywhere short of a loss. So I think you just got to keep giving the big fellow the ball here. And then it's decision time for Wheaton. Well, the other thing you can run, if you've been practicing this type of thing, this would be a great place for like a naked bootleg with the quarterback. I think they've shown that, too. That came out of this package, the touchdown to, to McJunkin. Yep. Third and less than a foot. Hibbins in the backfield. Hibbins in the end zone. Touchdown, Thunder. Oh, he Jake spiked Hibbins. It. He spiked it, and that means the extra point is going to be from 15 yards back. That was really bad. Wow. And it, you, you start to wonder if Wheaton would have gone for two. Oh, yeah. That takes that off the table 100%. It's an automatic penalty. So they'll have to kick it from the 20 instead of the... Actually, I believe it's a personal foul. So it'll be... Rizzolo plays a touchdown. After the play, unsportsmanlike conduct. Offense number 61, spiking the ball. 15-yard penalty being forced on the extra point. Yep. That's number 61's first unsportsmanlike foul. Huge play right there. Now it all goes on this operation that made 72 out of 74 five extra points this season missed the last one because of a bobbled snap and this becomes effectively a field goal for Bose. this will be and we'll see if they ice him too and he's five of nine from this range they're going to call timeout yep this is this so, is a 35 yard field goal first charge timeout griffin Bose is, is five for nine this year from 30 to 39 yards and this is going to be a 35 yard field goal effectively to try to tie the game now, Bose is a senior and one of your best players, so you got to lean on him. But, you know, really not a smart play there by, by Hibben. I mean, obviously, Coach Swider, Coach Scott going with Hibben on those four consecutive handoffs to get that touchdown, just leaning on him. But the emotion took over, and he just got to have composure. Wow, well, is that a big deal. It's a guy who's not used to putting the ball in the end zone. Just the second time he's done it. And it comes down to a 35-yard extra point from the middle of the field. St. John's has two timeouts if they choose to keep using them. Well, they're not going to use them. I mean, it's lose them. They're, they're nine seconds. They're probably not going to try to do anything and send this into overtime. No, well, I mean, if they continue to ice him. Head coach the, is not near the ref, so yep. I don't anticipate them using it. Snap put down. Extra point. Plenty of distance. He no missed good. it. And a flag. They roughed the kicker. Wow. They ran into Griffin Bowes. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. They're going to give off 15 yards back. Which puts the potential go for two in the win back on the table, if that's what Swider's thinking about. Jesse Scott looking down to Coach Swider. What do you want to do, if that's indeed what the call is? Well, they're still conferring. So normally in a field goal situation, this would be half the distance. But I assume in an extra point situation, it actually goes back to the original spot. But I don't know that that's the case. So I want to say it was a Jacksonville game earlier this season where you uh, had something like that where they chose to yep. go for two, had a penalty. That's a professional, which is yeah. sometimes those are different spotting things than, than college. I just don't know the rule. There are two fouls on the play. Substitution foul, 12 men on, de on offense. Personal foul, roughing the kicker on defense. Those fouls will offset. Replay. We'll replay wow. the down. We had too many right. men on the field. Wow. Okay, the drama just continues here with nine seconds left to go. The Thunder trying to kick what will amount to an extra point from 35 yards. Missed it already after Jake Hibben scored. The touchdown, a, a simple extra point would tie it, but he spiked the ball, resulting in a 15-yard penalty. And now you have Griffin Bowes to try to tie this game with nine seconds left. Distance wasn't the issue. Well, it hasn't been all season for him. Out of the hold of Bickle, Phil Barber, the long snapper, and now they another timeout. Again. Another timeout. And again, if they're going to snap Second the ball, take the out. kick. Yeah. St. John's. Because now... Griffin Bose has been standing out there for two, three minutes. Yep. Again, coming into this game, Griffin Bose just five of nine from this distance on field goal attempts this year. So 
again, play of the game, obviously, Thunder just trying to tie it up and hopefully send this game into overtime with only nine seconds left, although Jackson Erdman is Jackson Erdman. I, I, you know, if they get the ball back in a tie game, I would think there's a high likelihood it just goes into overtime. And it's worth remembering both of these teams have missed extra points. Wheaton had a chance to take the lead, and they bobbled the snap. We welcome all of you watching other games and joining us for this is the last quarterfinal game to finish. Wheaton just reached the end zone, and then Jake Hibben, who had the touchdown, spiked the football. So it was a 15-yard penalty. Wheaton missed the first try, but offsetting penalties, so we're going to do this again from the 25-yard line. Going through his routine. He didn't like it, so he went back up and started it all over again. The line's been sitting there a long time. And a lot of this comes down to the snap first. The snap has been the issue. Good snap. Good hold. Plenty of distance. No good it's again. good again. Missed it again. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. That's a tough one right there, folks. If you're a Wheaton fan, that's a tough way to go down. In, a, in a, what's been an epic game, but, you know, both sides making a couple of key mistakes. Both sides making some great plays. Really a fantastic Division Three football game, but to end in that fashion is going to be bitter for this senior team, for this senior squad, and for these all the Thunder fans here to get a penalty on the on what would have been the tying touchdown an extra point, and to uh, to miss two extra points really two extra points which effectively would win the game. That's that's the difference. And St. John's, who is the team that struggled with extra points, had one blocked obviously is now going to be the beneficiary of another team not being able to convert two extra points, and they're going to walk out of here and walk into the semifinals hosting next week against up in Collegeville against University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. And uh, there is an onside kick still to come. Nine seconds to play. Wheaton's out of timeouts. That's true. I should have. St. John's has one timeout remaining, so Griffin Bowes has to at least clear his head enough to come back and try to attempt an onside kick. His day might not be done. If Wheaton can corral it get a quick completion you might be trotting him back out there again to try to win the game well four behind him six to the near side Wheaton has not attempted an onside kick all year gets a good roll and ball ball's out. loose Wheaton's ball's got out. no no nope. it came loose for a moment I thought Wheaton had it Nichols jarred it loose they're fighting for it down below we haven't seen a signal yet St. Yeah. John's has the football, and Wheaton's season is over. It came loose right into the hands of, I couldn't see who the gunner was for Wheaton. That was right next to Nichols. It came loose into his hands, and he couldn't quite bring it in. An unbelievable finish here at McCauley Stadium. Yeah, great game really by both teams at different times. First half controlled by St. John's, second, the third quarter and the first part of the fourth controlled by Wheaton, and then heavyweight blows back and forth between two teams there. And the Thunder just won too many mistakes down the stretch and are, are going to lose to really a fantastic St. John's squad, a great program uh, who's going to go into another semifinal for a chance to go to the national championship. Tough pill to swallow for this Thunder team who's been a real pr privilege to watch and cover all season long. What a fantastic team. Jake Hibben just distraught. He's had a fantastic career and uh, should not at all be. Well, you come to the end and it's mistakes by two seniors that are going to end up ending your season. Yeah. Bose missed two extra points. Well, really the one negated. And then the... Well, the, and the other one wasn't his. It was a it was, it was a bad snap, correct? But it was bobbled snap. It was Jake Hibben who piled into the end zone to put Wheaton at the doorstep of an extra period or going for two for the win. And then he got overexcited, spiked the football, and that led to the miss. And the Thunder just absolutely distraught. For the second time in program history, their 12 and 0 season will end in the 13th game. They rolled out to Alliance in 2003, 12-0. And just a bitter pill to swallow. A lot of people here on the Wheaton side haven't moved. Just stunned by how this game has come to a close. 
So our final score, St. John's 34, Wheaton 33. Again, we will not have post-game interviews on the field because of the NCAA 10-minute cooling-off period. Stats and a recap of this game will be available on the Wheaton Athletics page, athletics.wheaton.edu. You can also see the post-game press conferences available there uh, on the Wheaton YouTube page following uh, their conclusion this afternoon. 34-33, to our, our final score. We promised you a heavyweight bout, and these two teams delivered in what is going to be an agonizingly long offseason after how this one ended for the Thunder. Yeah, this is going to be a tough one, especially for these these seniors who have put so much into it and came back on a mission and with a purpose. But, you know, uh, you, you, it either makes you stronger or makes you weaker. And the, the hallmark of this Thunder team is these kind of things have made them stronger. So they'll go into the offseason with a renewed sense of purpose for those that are returning. But a fantastic road win for St. John's. Congratulations to Coach Fashing and all the team on that side. Again, thoughts and prayers to those that were banged up that – uh, hopefully we'll be healthy to play next week. Both teams want to be have all of their weapons available as they go into the next game. For Doug Rothschild, I'm Russell Lindsay. Our outstanding production crew here with Suncom Communications doing a great job all season long. This one came down to the end, and a missed extra point is going to end the Thunder season. 34-33 our final in favor of St. John's. Thanks for tuning in to playoff football here on the Wheaton Thunder Sports Network.